Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the movie part of our series, What If Rookie Deku Becomes a Hero? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Spudlord from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Tamira Shigaraki, a man who would admit that he had lived a fairly messed up life, having killed his parents, his sister, and his dog, each getting worse the longer the list went, with each crime becoming more gruesome as before. Not even two days ago had he breached UA security, raided the USJ, and made an example of what exactly the misfits of society could do. Just like decades ago when people were judged for their color, now people were being judged by their quirks, a simple biological process that couldn't really be controlled. Some were born lucky with powerful quirks, while others had quirks that made them look like monsters. Those who were unfortunately to be born with villainous quirks were shunned from society, being forced to find comfort in the dark, in arms with the real villains. There were millions of people who had suffered from this, Tamira decided that he must do one thing, and that was erode society until he and Sensei could start it afresh, a world where everyone was equal. Plans often don't follow their desired route for an array of reasons, mainly it being some uncounted variable being thrown in, like All Might saving everyone from Namu. This was another example of things not going to plan. Tamira lightly gasped as he could feel the blood dripping down his neck from the multiple puncture wounds in his throat, and Tamira was quite disappointed with the way he went out. There were quirks that could change the weather, quirks that could create flames hot enough to melt the flesh off of your bones. But was Tamira lucky enough to go out in some grand way? No, a knife to the throat was what he got. Emerald green eyes were wide with fear. He hadn't expected to kill the man who was robbing the shop, merely stop his hand from grasping his head, since all of Izuku's instincts said to not leg that happen. Quirkless people, like him, were permitted to carry some form of weapon with them in case of an emergency, mainly a small dagger that wasn't even two inches long, but Izuku really couldn't complain. Izuku stood awkwardly in his place in the convenience store, it had just turned 11 p.m., the other people were plastered to the wall in fear, and the person behind the counter had already run off to call the cops, which Izuku could already faintly hear. The main issue was the man's ally, a misty man who was as baffled as Izuku was, and wasn't really certain on what to do in a situation like this. You killed Tamira, softly whispered the misty man, the name Tamira sparked a memory in Izuku. Tamira was the name of the guy who had busted into UA, showed the world that it could be done, and that made Izuku blink. What am I supposed to do? Confusedly mumbled the mist man, his piercing yellow eyes slowly looked around the store, landing on Izuku and looking at him. All Izuku wanted was a Diet Coke, he had a stressful day at high school in order to prove that he was worthy, by that Izuku meant handing in homework early, so he could relax and not worry about his very ordinary school. Not having a quirk like Izuku often made things unfair, making him the joke of the school, the bullied, and the hopeless, meaning that Izuku had zero chance of getting into UA. All Might had made a briefly appearance in Izuku's life, saving him from the slime villain, and Izuku had honestly contemplated latching onto the man's leg as he leaped away, but that would have been foolish of him, since he could die real easily. Green eyes widened as Izuku realized he had been in a trace, aware of the fact that the police were just about outside, and that an old school friend was in the shop with him. He killed the Yakuza leader. He is the new one, fearfully screamed Izuku's old friend. Friend may have been a bit of a stretch since he was a bully, but Izuku wasn't sure that's how the Yakuza worked, and considering the police had barged in and had their guns pointed at him didn't help. He has a knife, vividly bellowed Yaza, the name of Izuku's former bully. Izuku would have been insulted if he wasn't used to it. The misty man seemed stuck, stuck between escaping for himself or taking Izuku with him, and Izuku hoped that it was the former at this point, though considering there was a dead body at his feet, Izuku did not like his chances clearing things up. A split second of silence passed through the shop, bright yellow eyes stared into Izuku's own, silently questioning something before nodding. Are you ready to lead, new wise and supreme leader? Bluntly questioned the misty man, Izuku still didn't know his name but considering the fact these police looked violent honestly made Izuku consider. The wall beside Izuku exploded, a bullet lodged near his head was honestly not the best form of asking for surrender, and against all life goals and dreams, Izuku found himself nodding out of fear. Bright yellow eyes narrowed slightly, mist seeping down from the man's right arm, before a portal abruptly opened up beneath the guard's feet, making them disappear a second. Running out of the shop on instinct, Izuku was acutely aware of the fact that his heart was pounding in his ears. Fear clutched his heart at the thoughts of being killed, but Izuku felt alive, and that was something that he hadn't felt in a while. Being treated like a fragile object never did any good for anyone's confidence. Izuku theorized that was why he was going through with this, despite how bad and dangerous it was. Izuku and the misty man barged out of the shop. A second police car was there with the cop forming a barrier so nobody else could enter, and the second Izuku stepped out they froze. Adrenaline rushed through Izuku's body. The teen felt like he was in a vivid dream as both himself and the misty man leapt into the police car, Izuku in the driver's seat and the misty man beside him. They are getting away. 
harshly barked one of the five police officers, a man with bunny ears, and Izuku didn't waste a second in copying what his mom had done so often, flicking the key in the ignition, making the car purr to life. Stop them, hurriedly yelled the same man, a bullet implanting itself into the window, precisely where Izuku's head was, allowing Izuku to realize something. The police car was bulletproof. Can you drive? Curtly asked the misty man, cocking his head in completely confusion as Izuku denied it, slowly reaching up and grabbing onto the latch above, thinking that maybe he shouldn't let his new master make his grand reveal this way. We can learn, bluntly stated the misty man, feeling himself being pulled backwards as Izuku slammed down on the accelerator, quickly shifting up into second gear as bullets pinged against the window. The tires screamed against the ground as they tried gaining traction, throwing up smoke before the police car shot forward, causing a skid mark to form behind the car as it shot forward towards the crowd of onlookers. Green eyes widened in fear for an array of reasons. Not knowing how to drive was the biggest reason so far, but the school dance in a week was a close second. But Izuku felt like he wouldn't have to worry about it soon. Everyone luckily leaped out of the way, besides a skeletal man with blonde hair and sunken blue eyes. He was plastered to the windscreen for an awkward second, before Izuku hit every button he could think. Time felt like it had stopped for a second for Izuku, the skeletal man, and the skinny man, as a stream of water was blown up onto the windscreen, before the wipers awkwardly wiped the screen, along with the man's shocked face. Gravity took its course, dragging the man off of the windscreen and onto the roof of the car, where Izuku heard several pain grunts before focusing back onto the road, being forced to swerve away in order to not hit a building. Red and blue lights shone behind Izuku, followed by the loud wailing of the siren, as the police slowly started catching up with them, making tears gathered in the teen's eyes. They're gaining on us, hysterically wailed Izuku, his mind was trying to process this whole mess as best as it could, but even then it was struggling immensely. Third gear, that's a thing, right? Awkwardly asked the misty man, Izuku didn't waste a second in recalling the proper process of changing the clutch, instead favoring for slamming his foot down on the clutch, while changing into their gear. Should we introduce ourselves now, or later? Formally asked the misty man, Izuku peered over the driving wheel making sure the roar was clear and straight, before turning his head towards his accomplice and pursing his lips. The misty man seemed to realize his mistake, watching as Izuku abruptly shifted into fourth and then fifth gear, the wails of the sirens fading slightly in the distance, as Izuku had gone into a complete state of concentration. Izuku could only wonder how much worse this day could get, what would his mother think of him, what would happen to his mother from him doing this on impulse, would she even be safe. Things could get worse, in an array of ways. Sharply twisting the steering wheel while almost hyperventilating made the police car skid, almost making the car tumble over from the sheer speeds they were going, before the car shot forward into a small side road. The second worst thing was the heroes, Izuku never thought he would be one to find heroes annoying. But considering the fact that a man dressed as a knight came zooming up beside him, while holding an arrest warrant really made Izuku hate life. I shall take care of him. Helpfully informed the misty man, a portal opening up in front of the hero, making him disappear as quickly as he appeared, causing Izuku to briefly glance to his left at the misty man. I hope he can swim. Idly hummed the misty man, Izuku found that ominous enough not to comment on it, but Izuku serious hoped he meant a swimming pool. Buildings stretched as high as the eye could see, along with people leaping out of the way as Izuku slowly realized how dangerous and fun driving was, while swerving between cars, though the people tended to ruin the experience. Chewing on his upper lip, Izuku slammed down the clutch and shifted into sixth gear, trying to figure out where he was so he could avoid the more built-up areas. I just wanted to be a hero. Pitifully whined Izuku, jumping up slightly as a police car pulled up beside them. Both Izuku and the Misty Man could only watch in fear as a second police car pulled up on the other side, forcing Izuku to drive in the middle of the road. Not having a quirk didn't help, now killing some and stealing a diet cum really doesn't help. Good job Izuku, lowly cried Izuku, somehow perplexed by how the streets were this empty, though Izuku was aware that they were in a shadier part of the city at this point, but having three police cars drive side by side was odd. A cracking sound ran through the car, causing the misty man to slowly reach over and pull the walkie-talkie off of the radio, holding it up to his ear before looking to the left and right, seeing that the police car on the right had someone else on the radio. Each second the cars were getting faster, all the while the misty man was silently nodding along to what was being said, while maintaining eye contact with the officer in question. It was almost comical in fashion as a portal the same color as the man sitting beside Izuku opened up in front of them, which Izuku couldn't help but go through and winching, blinking in realization that they were still on the same street, but just going back the way they had come. A second passed before Izuku realized that he had more or less just eluded the police, making the teen pause for a second as he tried comprehending what had happened, realizing that the misty man beside him had a quirk that allowed him to warp people. So, where are we going? Uncertainly questioned Izuku, deciding that they may as well have a location in mind, considering there was only so much diesel in the car, and at some point or another it would run out. 
Give me a minute, I will open up a warp gate, but I'll need time to realize our location and how far away it is. Happily answered the misty man, closing his yellow eyes as he hummed slightly, leaving Izuku to do his own thing and try and keep them safe. Remember earlier when Izuku said that heroes were annoying, try the number two hero, that was definitely a sight to behold and fear. Even in the distance Izuku could see the orange glow of the man's hair, the way the air shimmered around him, and the way his bright blue eyes glowed with the flames. Izuku was not particularly fond of Endeavor, the man had always came off as incredibly violent when dealing with thugs, leaving permanent damage and burn marks on them, while also seeming incredibly arrogant. The man did have more crimes resolved than All Might did, but Endeavor also had more victims in a sense, as well as haters, that why Izuku didn't feel bad as he slowly sped up. Izuku wanted to be a hero, he was well aware of the fact that heroes had to injury villains at some point in their career, mainly to stop them from causing more harm to others, that's why Izuku started playing chicken with Endeavor. Life always handed people opportunities that they never expected, Endeavor never expected to tango with a speeding police car, Izuku never expected to have the opportunity to play chicken with the number 2 hero, and Kurajiri never expected Tamura to be killed so easily and for some random teen to become his master. Green eyes narrowed slightly in concentration as Izuku pushed further down on the accelerator, making the engine purr louder as Endeavor widened his stance, and Izuku chewed on his lower lip as the man stared down at him. Fifty meters between them, neither of them had moved from their place. Thirty-seven meets, Izuku was feeling a bit uneasy and Endeavor adjusted his stance slight. Twenty-three meters, Kurajiri opened his eyes trying to comprehend the situation as he watched what was going on. Eighteen meters, Kurajiri slowly put on his safety belt as he began gathering mist in his hands. 9 meters, a bead of sweat ran down Endeavor's face which was quickly evaporated. 3 meters, Izuku had steeled his nerves and was certain that Endeavor would be the one to move. 1 meter, a portal opened up in front of the car. Endeavor stood still for a second as he watched the portal close as quickly as it had appeared, allowing the man to realize something, that Punk and the Misty Punk had fully intended on hitting him if it wasn't for the portal. The green-haired boy was fully intending on hitting him, not a second later did the exact same portal open up in front of Endeavor again, making the man half slightly before the same police car came out. Was that necessary? Questioningly huffed Izuku, slamming down onto the brakes as there was now an Endeavor-shaped imprint of the front of the police car, though Izuku would deny that he had a small smile on his face. We both know we wanted that to happen. Emotionlessly explained the Misty Man, Izuku knew he shouldn't let this happen but he couldn't help respect the Misty Man beside him, he didn't even know his name but Izuku knew they would get along just fine. Now, we should reverse back into the portal, wisely informed the Misty Man, watching as Izuku changed the gear until it was in revere, driving backwards into the portal as Endeavor slowly slid off of it. Fair point, annoyedly grumbled Izuku, annoyed by the fact that he had been found out so easily but in his defense, he didn't hit Endeavor hard enough to kill him or anything, just break a few ribs and give him a nasty bruise. Where are we going anyway? Idly asked Izuku, looking over his shoulder as he started reversing, slowly edging the car backwards into the portal. The misty man's right arm shot forward, pushing Izuku backwards as the windscreen shatter, livid blue eyes and flaming hair filled Izuku's vision once he turned around, freezing in place as he realized that Endeavor had thrown himself through the windscreen to get at them. Everything went still for a second, Endeavor hadn't been prepared for the villain to be someone his son's age, and Izuku wasn't expecting Endeavor to get up so easily, only the misty man reacted. A fire extinguisher, Izuku didn't know that police cars even had those in police car, but watching the misty man pull out the safety pin and aim the nozzle at Endeavor really put things into perspective, before a stream of carbon dioxide was shot out, killing the flames on Endeavor's face. That lasted for about a second, Endeavor was left coughing as the flames on his face were completely killed and the extinguisher was emptied, the man was coughing as Izuku had halted the car. Is this how they are used? Confusedly mumbled the misty man, slamming the fire extinguisher into Endeavor's face a few times, before Izuku quickly grabbed it and aimed for the man's nose, a loud crunch echoing through the car as blood started gushing out of Endeavor's nose. Endeavor reeled back in pain, pulling himself back out of the windscreen while clutching onto his nose, trying to stop the bleeding from his now broken nose, and Endeavor could barely believe the fact that he had several broken ribs and a broken nose from a 15-year-old, the media would love this. Bright blue eyes watched as the police car slowly rolled back into the portal, which snapped shut a second later, leaving Endeavor alone. A whistling sound echoed overhead, a hulking figure dressed like he was from America landed near front of Endeavor, and Endeavor felt a scowl crossing his face as he saw the concerned look on All Might's face, although the man also had a bloody nose. Silence filled the area between the number one and two hero, neither of them could properly comprehend what had happened, Tamura Shigaraki was killed by someone who had been able to outmaneuver the police, Ingenium, Endeavor, and All Might. That green punk worries me, angrily snarled Endeavor, knowing that there was no use in chasing the police car anymore, since it could be anywhere at this point, and having several broken ribs made any form of movement difficult. He managed to come up with a solid escape plan on the fly, injured me to the point where moving is painful, gave you a bloody nose of all people, as much as I don't want to say it, he played us like the fiddle. 
Distantly sighed Endeavor, aware that his public image could be hurt more if they saw him reacting bad, and Endeavor was aware that this would be big. Intelligence boosting quirk. Quickly shot off all might, wiping the blood from his nose and chewed his lower lip, his brows creasing slightly as they recalled the scene. Out of everyone the police car hit him, it was just coincidence. We're going to need Nezu, won't we? Rhetorically questioned All Might. Fighting fire with fire was the appropriate term. Let the two geniuses duke it out and make the plans. Unless you somehow became smarter than you looked, yes, yes we will. Defeatedly coughed Endeavor, sitting down on the middle of the deserted street, gingerly rubbing his ribs as he realized that they hadn't punctured his lungs, which was lucky. We always deal with villains with physical fighting quirks, I wonder how this fight will go. Curiously hummed Endeavor, watching All Might sit down opposite him and shrug, both had fought many villains and thugs, but trying to outsmart a genius wasn't under their belt. Humiliating for the hero's side. Exasperatedly answered All Might, as much as Endeavor saw All Might for a rival, he did respect the man for his quick thinking and power, and his judgment was often correct. Unless we find the new master soon. Added on All Might, hearing a police car rapidly approaching them, making All Might leap up in case it was the one from earlier, though this one slowed down before them. The trill and excitement that had been clouding Izuku had quickly disappeared when he had gotten out of the police car and watched it disappear in a portal. The mortification of what he had done was slowly setting in, and Izuku was finding it hard to breathe. Currently Izuku and his misty pal were in a bar. The misty man was behind the counter as Izuku vacantly stared at the stock shelves behind him, contemplating what had happened within the course of ten minutes. Do you think I can go back to having a normal life? Softly whispered Izuku, he prided himself on the fact that he was logical and smart. After having a few seconds of peaceful thinking, Izuku knew the answer already. Assuming you mean a normal 15-year-old life, which involves going to school, getting good grades, and not being involved with the police. No, bluntly stated the misty man, clanking down a glass of water in front of Izuku a moment later, feeling sympathetic for the boy who had killed Tamura and had his life turned upside down. I am Kurajiri, your new... Helper. Uncertainly introduced Kurajiri, Tamura needed a caretaker but he already knew that it wasn't the case for Izuku. He simply needed help adjusting. Izuku Midoriya, and an absolute pleasure to be working with you. Sarcastically groaned Izuku, watching as Kurajiri turned on the television in the corner of the room, flicking through the channels until stopping in a static one. Silence filled the area for a second, the sound of something being dropped and broken on the other side of the screen made Izuku jump, he hadn't expected that nor the string of cursing that came with it. Izuku awkwardly took a sip of his water as he watched the screen, hearing more grumbling and complaining before looking at Kurajiri for hell, who simply nodded at him to be patient. So, you are the one who has killed Tamura. Soothingly hummed a voice on the TV, it was deep and silky sounding, and Izuku couldn't help but chew his lower lip nervously as he didn't think of the fact that Tamura had family. Tell me, Izuku Midoriya, what is it that made you kill Tamura for his position? Curiously purred the voice, Izuku sat flabbergasted on his stool before looking at Kurajiri for help. He had done this to prove a point, he had organized everything down to the last detail. He is simply remarkable, and he wants to reorganize society. Completely bullshitted Kurajiri, his face was straight and Izuku had a feeling that the man was being honest, that made Izuku slowly sink lower into his seat. I'm not certain if it is on the news, but Izuku has managed to outrun some speedy armored hero, injury endeavor of all people to the point moving is painful, and has escaped all might. Bluntly informed Kurajiri, a hum of interest coming from the other side of the screen, as Izuku tried mustering up the words to argue. Kurajiri, please turn on the news and prepare my regular drink. I wish to see my new apprentice in the news. Softly ordered the voice, the static noise slowly took over the TV, before Kurajiri quickly turned on the news which was just starting, and pulled out a glass of champagne. Izuku blinked owlishly, his mind was slowly being overwhelmed with how much had happened today. Just a few minutes prior had he accepted what had happened as a fluke that had ruined his life, but now Izuku realized that he might be destroyed if he doesn't comply. A black sludge rose up in the center of the room, before a well-dressed man with a black mask that covered the upper part of his head appeared, a small smile on the man's face before he turned his attention to Izuku. Breaking news. Loudly announced the TV, Izuku squeaked slightly in surprise at the sudden announcement before forgetting about the new man in favor of the news, gulping slightly as he saw a photo of a deceased Tamira on it. Tamira Shigaraki, the man who had led the attack on USJ two days ago was killed not 20 minutes ago in a convenience store near Dagaba Beach. It is believed that he was killed in order for the killer to become the leader of the League of Villains. Quickly reported the woman, she sat behind the counter of her desk. The mask-wearing man beside Izuku drank the glass of champagne in a clean swoop, and Izuku moaned. Not much is known about the killer currently, other than his first name is Izuku and is incredibly dangerous. If seen on the street please run away and wait for the heroes to show up. Continued on the woman, a photo of Izuku with Kurajiri beside him as they both bursted out of the shop appeared on screen, though a photoshopped snarl was on Izuku's face. 
Izuku has already outsmarted the police, has seriously injured the number two hero, Endeavor, and has managed to give All Might a bloody nose under unknown circumstances. It is believed that his quirks is super intelligence. Izuku is on par with Nezu of UA in terms of estimated intelligence, possibly higher. Fearfully added the woman, which was a complete lie since Izuku didn't have a quirk and he was certain he wasn't as smart as Nezu, but the masked man beside him seemed interested. Izuku has been awarded in a class villain status, and should only be dealt with by the pros. Joining us now is Nezu of UA. Carefully explained the woman, Izuku blinked in fear since in a class villain was rare and incredible dangerous, and normally meant for someone who was dangerous and not a quirkless 15-year-old. Hello there, I will keep this brief. Cheerfully chirped Nezu, who was an animal with a quirk, though he claimed to be a mixture of animals he looked like a mouse and was incredibly intelligent. Izuku, I will find you and outplay you. You may be smart, but I will have you in the most secure prison in Japan within a month. Happily informed Nezu, fear filled Izuku's heart as he watched the TV being turned off, before turning towards the other two people in the bar. Slamming his head against the bar, Izuku let out a muffled scream that sounded like a dog pining, as tears of frustration started gathering in his eyes at how quickly his life had went downhill. The world was unfair, Izuku remembered learning that at the tender age of four, and how he was bullied from being different than everyone else, that made Izuku frustrated. The perfect candidate to be my successor was killed tonight. Years of planning have been ruined, and I am completely stumped. Tiredly sighed the man beside Izuku, looking completely exhausted from everything, and Izuku knew the man was a villain, but at the moment he simply couldn't care. Tell me, what will you do now? Our lives have been completely ruined, we're both wanted by the heroes, and I guess we're stuck with one another now. Awkwardly asked the man, Izuku found himself growing in agreement at the statement. None of them could really have a normal life now. What can I do in this unfair world? I just wanted to be a hero but I was born quirkless. Pathetically moaned Izuku, stiffening up slightly as he realized something that he could do now. He couldn't have done it before since he had no social status and was feared, but now people would listen to him. I guess, we can change the world if you are interested. Softly asked Izuku, seeing the masked man beside him sit up slightly in interest, since had never done anything good before, so now was as good as time as any. Go on, years of work and planning have gone down the drain, may as well be useful when I'm alive. Interestedly hummed the man, hearing Kurajiri wiping the glass still, and it wasn't like he could create a new successor in a few months, plus being the one that always did the planning was boring. People are shunned from their quirks or sometimes lack of quirk. Nervously began Izuku, having captured the interest of both the masked man and Kurajiri in an instant. Both of them knew several people who had been shunned because of their quirk. How about we create a world where everyone is equal, doing it by not killing anyone? Exposing people who are corrupted, showing everyone that not all villains are villains, and that they deserve to have a chance as well. Determinedly informed Izuku, his voice slowly growing in volume with each word that escaped from his mouth, and against all better judgment both men agreed. All hail Izuku Midoriya, the leader with no social skills, combat skills, quirk, or any leadership quality. To the symbol of equality, long live that glorious bastard. Rocky green eyes slowly opened up, a beam of light shining down and piercing his eyes first thing in the morning wasn't exactly pleasant, but that didn't stop Izuku from rolling on his bed until the sunlight shone on the back of his head. Unlike his usual shrine of All Might merchandise that he would see first thing in the morning, Izuku saw a vacant white wall that had nothing on it, making the events of a few hours ago to come rushing back. I gotta clear my name. Sleepily yawned Izuku, somehow not overly bothered by the fact that he woke up in a new room, plus he had to find a way to contact his mother to let her know he was alright, though he didn't have a phone on him since it was at his mom's apartment. Gotta use the bathroom. Pathetically whined Izuku, contemplating on how to get out of bed for today and where the bathroom was, since all Izuku knew was his new bedroom and the bar, which really wasn't useful. Tumbling out of bed in the same clothes he had worn to the convenience store, Izuku couldn't help but pinch his nose at the smell of sweat that accompanied the tracksuit, making Izuku look around the empty room to see if there was anything else to wear. There was nothing, which was expected since Izuku had only been staying here for a few hours at this point, and hadn't had the chance to go about and buy other clothes. It would have been so cool to actually use the tickets I had for the UA Sports Festival. Disappointedly whined Izuku, remembering that he had taken a part-time over the summer in order to save up for a ticket, which he had gotten a few days ago, meaning that it was most likely useless now. What will be the next best step for clearing my name? Curiously mulled Izuku, he didn't want to be in a class villain for the rest of his life, and most a class villain tended to be alerted worldwide in case they tried escaping the country, which ruled that out for Izuku very quickly. There were multiple ranks a villain could receive, the minor nuisances, thugs would most commonly be a D-class, which meant they were quite weak and could be easily dealt with, with each rank further emphasizing on how dangerous the person was. The class tended to be dangerous people, whose quirks either allowed them to cause great destruction and death with ease, or quirks that could allow them to mess with the way a country was ran, even then there was an even higher class after a class. S-class villains, those were people who have killed hundreds and had completed unspeakable acts, and have done things that only a monster could do, and it turned out the masked man who had sat beside Izuku last night was one. 
By all rights, Izuku should have tried running in fear and alerting the police. The small issue was the fact that the police had been issued to use necessary force on him. And from his experience with the police last night, Izuku preferred his chances with two highly dangerous villains instead of the police. It's sad that I have to think like that. Dangerous people who have killed are my only hope of clearing my name, while the police will take me down. Loudly sniveled Izuku, washing his face and hands after reliving himself, the teen's stomach grumbling loudly. Guess I should at least try to eat. Quietly mumbled Izuku, despite not feeling hungry at all. Izuku knew it was from the stress of the last few hours. All but falling down the stairs to the bar, Izuku was greeted with a sight that he never expected to see. The masked man was laying across one of the tables for the private booth with a scratchy blanket over him, while Kirajiri was dishing up three western dishes on the bar. Green eyes blinked slowly as they tried comprehending what had happened, spotting the multiple empty bottles scattered around the masked man before quickly putting the picture together. As he get drunk often, curiously moaned Izuku, his bare feet touching against the bar floor, the teen only taking a lone step before his right foot went flying out from beneath him, making Izuku fall to the ground like a sack of potatoes. Sometimes, mainly when he recalls his brother, idly commented Kirajiri, multiple mini warp gates opening up beneath each bottle, making them disappear in an instant and Izuku could faintly hear the sound of bottles breaking in a room behind the bar. A western fry up, I hope you don't mind but I'll be turning on the news soon in order to see how much of a splash you've made. Proudly informed Kirajiri, his voice a low whisper as he eyed the masked man, and Izuku couldn't help but feel curious to know the masked man's name. You really don't have to ask me for permission. Awkwardly mumbled Izuku, picking himself up off of the ground and quietly made his way over towards one of the vacant stools, his nose wrinkling as the smell of alcohol invaded his nose. Thank you for the food. Meekly thanked Izuku, sitting down on the same stool as of last night and smiled, hearing the clicking of buttons as the TV groaned to life. Hello everyone. Lai Ren, back reporting on the biggest and most scandalous incident in years. Jolly introduced the same woman from last night. Izuku rolled his eyes in exasperation near the thoughts of more drama being pulled up about him, and more of his personal life being revealed. Endeavor, the number two hero is afraid of needles. Cheerfully informed the woman, Izuku chalked on some beans as he let out a mixture of a sigh of relief and a dry chuckle, since Izuku really needed that. Back on the more important note, more information has been found about the newest threat to Japan, Izuku Midoriya, whose childhood nickname is Deku, and which is now his villain name. Degradingly began lie, Izuku felt by a roar up his throat at the horrible nickname that Katsuki had given him, and for once Izuku bristled with anger. Deku is 15 years old, and get a load of this, he's quirkless. I'd say that this manhunt will be over in a few hours, since he's just a brat. Jokingly admitted lie, everything came to a halt as Izuku forgot how to breathe. All of his life he had been bullied and downtrodden for his lack of quirk. Even now it was happening. Tears of frustration gathered in Izuku's eyes. All he wanted in life was to make a difference, make people smile, and protect them, and just because he lacked something he couldn't help he was mocked for it, bullied and treated like scum. Izuku wasn't a fool. Izuku was well aware that there were others like him who were being bullied because of things they couldn't help. If they were born quirkless or had a villainous quirk then they were ridiculed and bullied for it. Crime rate has leapt up last night as well, from 5.37% to a whopping 7%. Amazedly spoke Lai, Izuku looked up through tear-filled eyes at the TV as he gulped. A picture of people being arrested for various reasons were briefly put on screen, but each had something in common. Izuku Midoriya, or the Equalizer as he's being called by villains, who have nothing better to be doing with their life other than ruin it for others have been arrested in numbers. They believe that he's some sort of god who will fix the system, but I must ask, why fix it when it isn't broken? There is no god. Coldly huffed lie, the TV was immediately cut out afterwards a second later, as Izuku tried erasing the images that had been burned in his mind forever. A smile photo of him standing in front of the world with a scales, a scales that was perfectly balanced, perfectly equal. I am sorry for turning the TV on, I hardly expected something like this to happen. Apologetically mumbled Kirajiri, pushing away his plate of food a second later, yellow eyes watching Izuku as he had been frozen stiff. What makes a hero? Confusedly mumbled Izuku, all his life he had thought that it involved saving people's lives from disasters and villains, villains who have used their quirk in public and hurt others, and they should be beaten up. A hero is someone who abides by the system and does what the government wants them to do, beat up villains without question. Groggily grumbled the masked man, slowly sitting up from the table and twisting his head from side to side, making bones crack loudly as he did so. A true hero is someone who saves those who are truly in need. They listen to the villain's issues and try and help them, changing the very fabric of society so that everyone can be happy. Wisely coughed the masked man, falling off of the table and onto the floor face first, moaning in pain as he slowly picked himself up. Izuku numbly picked at his food, not at all focusing on either of the other two people in the room as he stared at the food. The image of him with the scales in front of the world was still etched into his mind, and Izuku realized how childish his view had been. 
When someone accidentally used their quirk in public, they were arrested and had to pay a fine, except when the quirk would be useful for the hero side. And Izuku couldn't count how many times Katsuki had used his quirk in public and had gotten away with it, since it was powerful and flashy. Most unlucky people realize this at some point, the world is only fair to those who were born lucky. Sadly huffed the masked man, calmly eating away at his own food, but Izuku could tell that the man was upset from an array of reasons, and Izuku couldn't comprehend which one hurt the man at most. Not all heroes can be angels, so I must ask you Izuku. Will you fight for your rights of equality, or will give up like the dog you are? Curiously asked the masked man, the black mask turned towards Izuku, who was still looking down at his scarcely touched food. Izuku's lips parted as the teen thought about his answer. He could very well just give up at this point since the heroes knew he was quirkless and in their eyes not a threat. But the image of the people believing in him, despite being quirkless, was still in his mind. For the first time in his life people believed in him, believed that he could make a difference, believed that he could be a hero. My spleen will most likely get broken at some point from this, but will you guys help me fix this world? Softly asked Izuku, a spark leaping behind his eyes as the teen clenched his jaw, watching as the two men smiled at him before nodding in agreement. We'll need allies, information, and a banner. Awkwardly mumbled Izuku, wondering if it would be plagiarism if he took the photo of himself with the scales, though Izuku doubted they would mind him using it. Kirajiri can organize the first two. Quickly answered the man, taking off the mask on his head, revealing the man's face to be horribly scarred to the point where Izuku couldn't even see his eyes. I used to be a great drawer back in my day. Giddily admitted the very dangerous man, Izuku was tempted to ask how he could see without his eyes, and it was a fight that Izuku was losing. Ken, you, you know, see, meekly asked Izuku, receiving a stare from the man, and Izuku could not tell if the man was glaring at him in anger or was staring at him in disappointment, but Izuku had a feeling that it was a fine mixture between the two. How about paper and pencils? Do we have those? Idly questioned Izuku, seeing the previous masked man look around the bar before shrugging. Kirajiri pinched the bridge of his nose in exasperation as he stared at the two of them. Or we could use a laptop, you know, saving the environment. Exasperatedly sighed Kirajiri, making Izuku nod and understanding since they were trying to be the good guys, just now the qualified good guys. Izuku Midoriya, I am certain that you are listening to this and I apologize for the degrading comments that were made towards you specifically. Sincerely apologized Nezu, Izuku was faintly listening to the TV as he was going though multiple tabs. Sensei was what the masked man had asked to be called was on his left, using the second laptop that Kirajiri had got from somewhere. I still intend on keeping my promise, I will use everything I have to capture you. Quirkless or not, you are still incredibly intelligent. Finished Nezu, the TV was placed on mute, but out of the corner of his eye, Izuku saw a bandaged Endeavor slowly walking onto stage. Kirajiri had disappeared a while ago to make a phone call to an ally of Sensei's, some sort of information gather or something along those lines, but Izuku's main focus was on the laptop in front of him. Izuku was deep in the web, deep enough for Izuku to be questioning what he was exactly seeing, if it wasn't his first time here and didn't know what to do, and Izuku knew how to navigate the web. So, do you have any idea what we're supposed to be doing to bring equality? Awkwardly asked Izuku, he had a few ideas on how to do so, they were actually theories with no real traction behind them, but they sounded like a good plan. I don't really have any experience in rearranging society. Blamely explained Izuku, watching as Sensei was busy scribbling away on the laptop, and the poster was looking surprisingly well. Kid, I've been around since Quirks first showed up and I built an empire with my Quirk that allows me to take and give Quirks. I can rearrange society, not just a good society if you get me. Distractedly grunted Sensei, pausing what he was doing before blankly staring at the wall, an amused smile on the man's face as he thought of some of his most malicious deeds. I've rigged All Might's bank account so I get 10% of his wage. Once a man all of his contacts will get random names, his ringtone will become the theme song for Boku no Pico, and he receives links to questionable websites. Maliciously chuckled Sensei, Izuku pursed his lips as he was honestly underwhelmed by the man's deeds, it was kinda a letdown. For the self-proclaimed symbol of evil, your deeds are honestly underwhelming and easy to do. Weakly deadpan Izuku, watching as the symbol of all of pathetic deflated, the man would most likely be crying if he had eyes, but he didn't have those so he couldn't. Plus what is Boku no Pico? Confusedly hummed Izuku, unaware of the savage grin that had grown on Sensei's face, as Izuku felt his limbs get locked in place as Sensei shuffled over towards Izuku. You're about to find out, this is calling my greatest achievements weak. Viciously snarled Sensei, typing away at the laptop at amazing speeds despite not being able to see, but Izuku guessed that the man had a few sensing quirks in his arsenal. I am sorry brother, I've shown this curse to you when we were young and innocent, now I must do it to another. Sadly sighed Sensei, it was then did Izuku start violently trying to get free from his restraints, green eyes widening in fear once he saw the description. I am back. 
politely greeted Kirajiri he had been gone for the better part of an hour and a half, having had a detailed discussion with an ally of the League of Villains whose new name was under construction. The name of the League was a bit lengthy but it was Izuku's idea. Have you done much? Furiously asked Kirajiri, closing the door behind him and putting his coat on the coat rack, before turning back to see the process that both Izuku and Sensei had made. Red liquid covered the floor as Izuku was pressed into a corner, a stool being held in his left hand while a broken wine bottle was in his right. While Sensei was howling in laughter on the ground with blood streaming down his nose, making Kirajiri purse his misty lips. Yellow eyes stared into the scarred green eyes of Izuku, the teen had seen something unspeakable, and Kirajiri knew that asking Izuku would only scar both of them. Praise Izuku for taking the damage. I have memorized every hero's quirk in Japan. Defiantly screamed Izuku, weakly shuffling while hiding behind Kirajiri's most prized stool. One of the most expensive bottles of wine Japan had to offer had been broken, and there was a hole in the ceiling. This man has drawn a dick for our banner and has shown me something unspeakable. Loudly shouted Izuku, Kirajiri actually took a moment to look at Sensei's laptop, which sure enough had a very detailed dick on it. Sweet 16. Childishly chuckled Sensei, the man had always been a joker and had gone with the flow, so Kirajiri wasn't overly surprised since nobody normally expected something great to come from Sensei, more so an accidental discovery. Your 180 old man, victoriously howled Izuku, leaping forward while dropping the remains of the broken glass, only to be halted in midair by a floating pillow. Kirajiri watched as the figurehead of the League of Villains whose new name was under construction, and the actual leader of League of Villains whose new name was under construction babbled like children. Izuku wasn't that far off from being a child, but Sensei was an adult. There was something disappointing watching them fight, but that didn't stop Kirajiri from snapping his fingers together and summoning all of the supplies he had acquired. Various objects clattered on the floor, away from the expensive wine that had been so carefully cherished by Kirajiri. A waste that it had not been drank but Kirajiri himself wasn't one to drink, so Sensei would have been the one to drink it at some point. There was a lone flashbang, tin food, blankets, phones, and a third laptop in the supplies Kirajiri had acquired, along with some makeup, a dress, hair dye, wigs, and some feminine shoes. Sensei, I have acquired the female products you have asked for, and I've gotten the flashbang Izuku. Calmly informed Kirajiri, Izuku's eyes widened slightly as he quickly scampered towards the flashbang and quickly shoved it into his pocket. Why do I have a sinking feeling about the female clothes? Awkwardly mumbled Izuku, already picking up the dress and looking at it. It was already his size. Not that Izuku was buff by any means, but he definitely had some muscle. Silence filled the bar. Sensei was aware that Izuku shouldn't stay cramped up in the bar all day, nor did he hide his face like Tamira so his face was pretty recognizable. A sharp huff escaped Sensei's lips. He had many quirks that could do various things. One of his favorite was a quirk that let him know someone's embarrassing secret, and Izuku's was that he could do makeup really well. I need to show you something that could help you redeem your name, it would help if you could see without being chased by the police. Honestly answered Sensei, he was genuinely serious about trying to be the good guy for a change. He had killed thousands of people and done more unspeakable acts, but it was about time that Sensei should at least try he good. It has to do with how I found Tamira, since I doubt that he is the only one who has went through something like this. Sadly sighed Sensei, a lot of children had awakened their quirks only to realize that the quirk was too strong for them, or they couldn't figure out how it worked. Give me ten minutes. Defeatedly huffed Izuku, did he know how Tamira got involved with Sensei? No he didn't, but Izuku wouldn't lie and say he wasn't curious as to how. I want to hit you with a car. Quietly whispered Izuku, he had done the foundation on his face and hands so that he had appeared paler, along with covering up his recognizable freckles, which was incredibly easy since the makeup was so good. If I can seriously wound Endeavor, who had more muscles than you do appeal, you'd be dead and I'd be happy. Viciously murmured Izuku, it felt weird walking beside Sensei who had left his mask at the bar and was instead using a walking stick. Being dressed as a girl and walking down a town he hadn't been to before with one of the most dangerous villains in the world. While said villain was pretending to be blind and couldn't speak Japanese, forcing Izuku to try and use his mediocre English. The small smile on Sensei's face told Izuku that he knew that he hated it. Izuku had been tempted to trip Sensei up on more than one occasion. But there was another reason for why Izuku was walking relatively close to the man, the reason being the other people. Never in his life had Izuku felt so many gazes on him. Not all of them were the happy and pure gazes Izuku hoped to receive, but that's what happens when you were already skinny and knew how to do makeup. Stop your whining, we're here. Softly whispered Sensei, rounding in corner which brought the duo into an alley. The gear that Izuku had been forced to carry was slowly making sense, since there was a lot of tin food, clothes, and blanket in the bag. Quirks were often kind but also cruel. Izuku had been told a bit of Tamira's past, the way that he had accidentally killed his entire family, simply because his quirk was so powerful and destructive. Izuku wasn't a fool, it was possible that other kids had gone through something like that. The Hero 13 had a quirk that was similar to a black hole and that could kill easily. So Izuku knew that there was others out there who were like Tamira, and being quirkless wasn't so bad suddenly. 
Izuku gently walked forward and placed the bag on the ground. A pair of gentle maroon eyes peeked around from the dumpster. White hair was filled with dirt and Izuku could see the fear in the girl's eyes, as she had a lone horn growing from the right side of her head. Sir Nidai's agency was around here. Izuku gulped slightly as he also realized that a Yakuza group was also around here, making Izuku wearily look around. There are hundreds, if not thousands of little children out here on the street already, being left alone simply because their quirks are dangerous. This is why Tamira wanted to change society, and so do you, isn't. Soothingly whispered Sensei, cocking his head slightly as he heard something. A scowl on his face as a pressure settled around the area though the girl was oblivious to it. Hiri, what did I say about running off? Hauntingly tutted a soothing voice, the girl called her he stiffened up in fear before running at Izuku, hiding behind Izuku's dress a second later. A man with a plague doctor mask covering the lower part of his face emerged from the back of the alleyway, a confident gleam in the man's eyes as he sauntered forward, a pair of white gloves on his hands as he stood above Izuku. The man had obviously some form of wealth judging from his green coat, with the purple fur around it, yet fear seemed to creep into his eyes as he looked at Sensei. Akai Chisaki, the newest leader of the Yakuza. A pleasant surprise, is it not? Menacingly greeted Sensei, a sharp smile on the Sensei's lips as he took a step forward, all the while he maneuvered himself so he was in front of Izuku and the girl. Izuku Midoriya wants to speak with you. Suddenly added on Sensei, Izuku blinked once in surprise before taking a step forward, a nervous smile on his face. Isn't the equalizer a guy? Confusedly mumbled Chisaki, Izuku didn't waste a second in taking off his wig and showing his curly green hair, which was luckily enough to convince the man. Awkward silence filled the area as Izuku tried to figure out why Sensei had called him out like that, that Yakuza as a whole was already monitored closely by various companies, so they couldn't do much. Glancing down at the girl beside him, Izuku couldn't help but recall Tamira's backstory, the way he had been forced to live on the streets for a while. How would you like to change society? Slowly asked Izuku, there was now less than a meter between him and Chisaki, and Izuku couldn't help but feel the hairs on the back of his neck slowly stand up. Equalizer, I simply wish to eradicate quirks. They are a plague on humanity, having infected people with syndromes of heroism and villainy. Softly whispered Chisaki, the man's villain name was Overhaul if Izuku recalled correctly. He simply wished to make everyone equal, that is admirable, but I wish to eradicate quirks altogether. Now hand back the girl. Viciously stated Chisaki, lurching forward and the next thing Izuku felt a hand on his face, green eyes widened in fear. Something popped and Izuku felt himself to lightheaded. He wasn't dead from what he was aware, he could still feel his heart beating but the hand on his face was gone. Green eyes blinked slightly as Izuku could feel teen girl cover behind him, making Izuku focus on the frozen overhaul whose arm was limply hanging down by his side, fear visible in his eyes. You should always stay vigilant Izuku. Disappointedly sighed Sensei, tapping on the wall beside him twice, the first time the wall completely broke and the second time it was fixed. Now Chisaki, you are cured and it seems like we've nothing else to talk about. Calmly spoke Sensei, watching as Chisaki sprinted away, all the while Izuku and Iri stood still. Overhaul should have killed him. Izuku felt the pain of his head being destroyed for a brief second before it was gone. The teen was well aware of what Sensei had actually done. He had died for a second. Sensei stole Chisaki's quirk and reverted Izuku back, allowing him to live once again. What will we do with the child? Slowly mused Izuku, decoding to address the main issue since the girl called her he was still standing behind him, making Izuku slowly look around and look at the girl. I'm Izuku Midoriya, do you know where your parents are? Softly questioned Izuku, hearing Sensei take a step backwards, making Izuku appreciate his actions since the man wasn't child-friendly. The white-haired girl shook her head in denial, making Izuku purse his lips as he saw the girl move her lips, trying to say something but no words were coming out. Reaching into the bag, Izuku slowly pulled out a bottle of water and handing it to the girl, watching the girl gingerly accept it and guzzle down the drink. How much of this way planned? Discreetly asked Izuku, looking at Sensei who was busy staring down at his right hand, looking back at Izuku a second later with a smile. I merely wanted to show you the children who suffer like this, Chisaki was someone who I was planning on eliminating since his quirk was dangerous, but I decided to take advantage of the opportunity. Honestly answered Sensei, he was internally debating something, and Izuku knew he wouldn't get much else from the man so he looked back at Iri. My dad disappeared. Gently whispered Iri, her voice was barely audible for Izuku to hear, but he could understand what most likely happened, the girl's quirk was the cause. My mom left me, sadly murmured Iri, Izuku slowly crouched down in front of the girl and offered her a hand, a plan forming in Izuku's head a second later. So, we're opening up an orphanage, training facility for children who live on the street and cannot control their quirks. Curiously asked Kirajiri, gently cutting up an apple for the white-haired girl Izuku and Sensei had brought back. He needed to get her a change of clothes and some medicine he noted. That's the plan. With Sensei's money and quirk that can identify others' quirks, and my intelligence, we can build up a good facility and I can create a training schedule for them. Happily noted Izuku, he had already figured out that Iri's quirk allowed her to rewind something. It was a stockpiling quirk in a sense, but with subtle differences. 
Her horn was an additional effect of her quirk. The larger her horn, the more energy she had stored up. But from what Izuku had gathered was that she had only used her quirk once. That one time she used it to eradicate her father from existence, and that was scary. Her quirk leg her rewind a biological object back to the point it was created. Izuku didn't know how much energy it took to do that, but Izuku hoped it would take a lot. If the heroes find out, they could accuse you of creating a child army. Warningly stated Kirajiri, Izuku was well aware of this. The thought had crossed his mind as soon as the idea came to mind. But if Izuku didn't do it, then who would? I'd rather be accused of creating an army than let children die. Softly whispered Izuku, sitting down and turning on the laptop, rapidly typing into the search bar for a place to buy, a place that was large enough to hold enough children to make a start. Besides, we have the money to do this and I'm certain that people will be genuinely interested in helping. Not everyday civilians, but more so retired heroes. Gently whispered Izuku, people saw it as a hero's job to help someone in need. Civilians wouldn't help anyone who was in need of help, simply because it wasn't their job. Wait they finished one piece. Excitedly shouted Sensei, Izuku could not see how this weeb of a man could even be a super villain at this point. Sure the man had some cool moments, but that was more luck than anything else. The doctor must know of this, softly squealed Sensei, diving out of his seat and disappearing in a puff of smoke, making Izuku raise his eyebrow in confusion. The doctor helped save Sensei's life when he mortally injured. Now the doctor is trying to find a way in saving humanity from the quirk singularity theory. Calmly filled in Kirajiri, Dr. Kudai Garaki, that was the name of the man who proposed that theory 70 years ago if Izuku recalled. Pursing his lips slightly, Izuku couldn't help but think back to Chisaki saying that quirks were a sickness, and Dr. Kudai Garaki theory about the quirk singularity doomsday theory. The sad thing was, Izuku could see their points. Eri killed her own father with her quirk, a quirk she could barely control. One day some kid could be unfortunate enough to break his limbs whenever he uses his quirk. That's why people needed to know how to use them. Here, Hasu City has a good few empty hotels, apartments, and has a good few retired heroes in it. Happily chuckled Izuku, silently noting the fact that there was an abandoned quirk gym relatively close by the hotels, which were quite easy to get a license for. There was one small issue, just a tiny one that could hopefully dealt with. The new uprising villain that had come to light less than a few hours ago, the hero killer, Stain was also in that city. A day, that's how long Izuku had been in a class villain at this point, and he already had a way on clearing his name, though it might take time, Izuku hoped that it would blow over and he could live a normal life again. Having a bipedal mouse trail him for the better part of four minutes wasn't Izuku's idea of fun, especially walking straight in a pair of heels given to him by the devil himself, meaning Sensei was having way too much fun making Izuku use his makeup talent. Izuku really wasn't one to curse, he had come to Hasu City to check out the apartments that had been put up for sale, they had actually been in surprisingly good condition despite their outside appearance, and wouldn't take that much to repair. Stumbling as he walked into a cafe, hoping that the mouse known as Nezu would leave him alone once he entered was a desperate idea. An idea Izuku was committed to since Nezu most likely didn't know that he had checked out the apartments wailed, and Kurajiri was keeping an eye on him. Sitting down at one of the vacant tables, Izuku pursed his lips as Nezu walked into the cafe. Beady black eyes lit up in delight as they landed on Izuku, before the mouse walked over. I promised I'd find within less than month. Hauntingly whispered Nezu, Izuku didn't have a clue how Nezu had actually found him, that was something Izuku wanted to know. Bold of you to assume I didn't lead you here. Blatantly bullshitted Izuku, recalling what Sensei had told him before going off to binge watch One Piece, and that was to lie when you were trapped in a situation, make them doubt themselves. It's quite enough here, and I'm not worried. Why don't we talk like civilized individuals? Why did you become a hero? Hot chocolate please. Idly hummed Izuku, his voice was already girlish due to some practice, and Izuku was thankful that the waiter had only just arrived. Mocha please, cheerfully chirped Nezu, black beady eyes were farting around the cafe that they had entered. The mouse's brain was a whirl of thoughts as he tried figuring out Izuku's angle. For a man who's cornered, you seemed awfully relaxed. Calmly noted Nezu, watching as a small smile slowly grew on Izuku's face, making Nezu stiffen slightly. I've no clue what I'm doing. Worriedly thought Izuku, sitting opposite him was one of the smartest person in the world. Izuku wasn't how smart Nezu was but he was smart enough to find out where Izuku was, without any noticeable hints. I can be saying the same for you. Bluntly stated Izuku, resisting the urge to chew on the inside of his cheek, forcing himself to have a small smile on his face as he looked over at two other people. Both people blushed slightly once they realized they had been caught staring, before looking away. Acting, that was something Izuku really should invest in at this point. Playing poker was also a good investment. The game was already quite simple once you counted the cards, and all Izuku really needed was the poker face. Nezu looked at the two people in question, calculating who they were but his mind drew up a blank. The mouse started fiddling with his fingers a second later. So you were randomly walking down the streets earlier, were you? You simply wanted to speak with me. Interesting. Idly hummed Nezu, Izuku wasn't certain why Nezu was reading so much into it at this point, but who was Izuku to complain since that meant he had less work to do. I became a hero, simply because I wanted to help people. 
Why did you walk down the path of villainy? Slowly informed Nezu, their drinks were delivered a second later, and Izuku mulled over the question. Instead of verbally answering the question, Izuku took out his phone and began opening slightly, holding up his right hand and hoped that Nezu would be patient before showing Nezu the photo. There were twelve children living in the alleyway in the photo, with Izuku in the middle of handing out various supplies to the children, making Nezu fiddle with his fingers. Heroes claim to rescue people, they rescue people in disasters and stop villains, nothing more. Society decided that helping people was a hero's job, so it's up to me, a villain, to save children who cannot control their quirk because the heroes won't. Disappointedly sighed Izuku, he was sad with himself for never once considering this fact, he wanted to be a hero yet he never thought about saving children on the street. Tamira was a child like that, the only reason he became a villain was because nobody helped him, so I'm trying to stop this from happening to others. Sadly informed Izuku, his phone started vibrating in his hand, before the ringtone started blaring. Poi wo shi yo kisu suru minai. Poi wo shi yo mi wo mitsumit. Poi wo dakashimit. Fear filled Izuku's eyes as he realized the tune, the dreaded tune that had haunted his nightmare last night. Memories of him being locked in place and being forced to listen to this song, the images of what he was shown surfaced to mind, Boku no Pico. Nezu's eyes widened slightly, beady black eyes glazing over as the mouse recalled seeing that show, All Might had sent him something via email and the link was attached. No matter what Nezu did, the link would not close and it just kept on playing. Sympathy and understanding that transcended human or animal understanding passed between two geniuses. Both of them understood the other's pain, that only a few other people alive could understanding. One for all was truly a wicked villain, specializing in mentally scaring his targets, make them fear answering or even looking at any piece of technology. I thought Sensei was rewatching One Piece with the doctor, when did he even have the time to do this against me? Disappointedly mused Izuku, realizing that he was going to have to find a way to stop Sensei from doing this, especially from doing it to the kids. Sometimes it's the harmless things that can define a generation. Distantly thought Izuku, forcefully ending the call a second later. I believe that is all for today Izuku, we've both learned a great deal about one another, but I'm not willing to take the risk in capturing you just yet. Idly hummed Nezu, shivering violently as he recalled each scene in vivid detail, making the mouse almost vomit across the floor. You will most likely see me on the news later, and I'm sure the hero side will loathe it. Softly whispered Nezu, getting up from the chair and quickly scampering out. Green eyes blinked in confusion, as Izuku sipped from his hot chocolate a second later, eyeing Nezu cheerfully walked down the street, before returning his focus back onto the empty chair in front of him. The mocha Nezu had ordered was in front of Izuku, making the teen narrow his eyes in anger as Izuku realized why Nezu left so quickly. That rat bastard is making me pay for both of them. Disbelievingly realized Izuku, a small smile growing on his face as he realized what Nezu was like, and that meant Izuku couldn't waste a second with his plans. Izuku wasn't certain when he had started getting used to throwing various sharp objects at Sensei without feeling any remorse. Izuku was certain that it wasn't natural not to feel a thing as one threw knives at a man, but boy did Izuku relish the feeling. It helped nobody here since Kirajiri was out clothes shopping with Iri. The man simply wore a paper bag over his head along with a pair of gloves. Izuku didn't know how that worked as a disguise, but it did for some strange reason. Sensei, why did you decide to do good now? You've said you've been evil since your twenties, so why now? Curiously inquired Izuku, halting his barrage of knife throws, which were quite on point now, and Izuku wondered where all the knives came from. I was afraid of this question you know. Tiredly sighed Sensei, pausing the episode of One Piece he was on, episode 40 now which was impressive given the short amount of time he had been watching it for. There are questions we all fear, mine just happens to be that one. Exasperatedly moaned Sensei, he sounded a bit tipsy beside Izuku making sure the man hadn't had a drink at all, Kurajiri had entrusted him with the jets. You don't have to answer it. It's just that you're the big, bag boogie man of the dark side, yet you never act like how I imagine you'd act. Confusedly mumbled Izuku, plonking himself down onto one of the many empty bar stools, watching as Sensei was looking anywhere but at Izuku. My brother was always sick, he was never the healthiest of people out there, coughing up blood regularly when we were children, and then our quirks appeared. He never knew he had a quirk but I knew he did. My quirk let me take other quirks and give them to others, while my brother's quirk simply allowed him to pass on his own quirk, and then I developed a plan. Distractedly hummed Sensei, Izuku never knew the man's name other than his quirk and that he was old enough to be in the first generation of quirk users. I built an empire, having people become in debt to me so I can find out what their quirks were and all the quirks that existed. I simply planned on finding a quirk that could heal my brother, but instead of being happy he became upset at what I had done for him. Sadly sighed Sensei, looking down at his own hands as if he had done something and was ashamed of it. He confronted me, yelled at me what I was doing wrong, and when I was clouded in emotions I forced a simple stockpiling quirk onto him, making him pass out. What I didn't know was that my brother's quirk and the stockpiling quirk fused, creating one for all, which is in possession of all might. 
My brother fought me, he believed in what he was doing was good, while I simply got rid of the quirks that people didn't want and gave them to someone else. Weakly chuckled Sensei, Izuku's eyes widened as he could barely believe what he was hearing, even then it sounded far-fetched. I killed my brother simply because he didn't stop. A piece of my brother lives inside of one for all I realized. I wanted it back for a while but you remind me of him. It was then I decided I will try and follow my brother's idea of creating a good world. Defeatedly wheezed Sensei, green eyes softened slightly as he realized he had never been seeing Sensei, only the mask he had put on. All for one was a broken man, pure and simple, he killed his own brother and had been forced to live nearly two centuries with that curse, knowing that a part of your brother was still alive, yet you'd never be able to see him again. Despite all of that, Sensei had decided to try and make amends for his deeds at last. The best time to have done so was as soon as he did that, the next best time was today. I guess every hero and villain has their story, softly whispered Izuku, gulping slightly as he was realizing how childish his views had been a few days ago, that villains were simple bad people who should be put in jail, but some were just victim of circumstance. I can at least try and make a difference, determinedly thought Izuku, hearing the TV being flicked on, making both Izuku and Sensei look at it. Nezu and the reporter from the first day of Izuku's accident was on screen. The former was being backed up by a man who looked like he was a DJ host, present Mike, Izuku realized, and a man who looked like he lived on the street. The man who looked homeless and was dressed in all black had a scowl on his face, obliviously annoyed at something, probably his horrible appearance and the fact he was on live television. Why am I even here? Bemusedly moaned the black-haired man, his scruffy appearance was slowly being engulfed by a yellow bag, making the man fall down a second later. So Nezu, you're telling me that you had Izuku Midoriya in your grasp today, only for him to outsmart you. Bewilderedly asked Lai Ren, it was obvious for Izuku and Sensei that she didn't think highly of him, which was kinda warranted since Izuku really didn't plan anything. Not only outsmarted me, he had me completely trapped in a corner, and due to some scouting and investigating, courteous of a certain hero who can erase quirks, I have some additional information to add about Izuku. Happily chirped Nezu, Izuku slowly looked at Sensei before looking back at the TV, both equally confused. He is a master of disguise, if it wasn't for the purposeful fact that he did nothing with his eyes, I wouldn't have recognized him, which he used to lead me to a cafe. I had my scout use his quirk on him. On the instant he did so, Izuku reacted badly to it, meaning that there's a possibility that Izuku does in fact have an intelligence boosting quirk that's possibly higher than my own. I will now play a clip to show. Helpfully hummed Nezu, clicking on a button that made the news being taken over by a recording. Izuku could clearly find himself, mainly because he was alone and there was a giant red circle around him, with the camera swapping between Izuku and the scruffy man, whose eyes went red and his hair started floating. The camera focused on Izuku immediately, just in time to catch him falling. The recorded Izuku didn't even catch himself, allowing his head to hit the ground. I just tripped on my heels. Awkwardly recalled Izuku, it wasn't that surprising since he was still getting used to them, but they were awkward to use. Then there's also the cafe, where I intended on capturing Izuku but was unfortunately outsmarted since he had two dangerous Yakuza members whose clan we aren't aware of yet in there, which means that Izuku Midoriya has already made allies with one of the Yakuza in Japan. Seriously spoke Nezu, Izuku couldn't help but taking a spit take at what had just happened, and from the way Sensei's scarred face looked at him, he didn't believe it either. You sure you don't have some sort of chaotic luck quirk? I've never seen someone's life be so horrible yet so incredibly complexly lucky at the same time. Dazedly coughed Sensei, that was a quirk he wouldn't want, since he could see the dead look in Izuku's eyes, despite it being the teen's normal luck. Do you want to take it? I'll gladly give it to you, if I have a chaotic luck quirk. Hurriedly offered Izuku, watching as Sensei did his version of a deadpan, which involved the man staring at Izuku. That's why I would like to propose this. Izuku Midoriya, he is obviously a genius in terms of intelligence being someone I'd call a rival, a master strategist, someone who possesses a charisma to him, and from what he told me, he will make the heroes look like the bad guys soon. Seriously informed Nezu, the first three were completely false in every way, shape, and form, with the latter being somewhat serious. That's why I'd like to propose this, Izuku Midoriya's villain class should be put up to S class immediately. Stiffly admitted Nezu, the two men behind seemed shocked at the announcement, while Sensei simply whistled in amazement. For those who don't know, S class villain is incredibly rare, with there only being one or so a decade. The previous S class villain was Toxic Chainsaw, who was only defeated by All Might himself. Now, Izuku Midoriya, who is in a different boat altogether, is now being described as a S class villain, who will whisper sweet lies and win over the public. Unbelievably whispered lie, Sensei scoffed slightly since he was also a S class villain, but that was a century ago. It is not lies, I've witnessed him being nice to others already, and I found my heart moved. He helped elderly people cross the street, get cats out of trees, and picking up litter. He's being a better hero than most heroes. And that scares me. Honestly whispered Nezu, the mouse was genuine afraid of Izuku, not for his strength, his intelligence was unnerving. But it was the fact that it was a motive everyone could get behind scared him, and soon Izuku could rise above the hero's grasp, becoming a role model. 
If he is not stopped soon, I do not believe that anyone could stop him shortly, not because he is powerful but because he would be considered a saint, a leader, a figurehead, on par or possibly above all might status. Quietly mumbled Nezu, everyone who was listening to this was shocked that the thought could even be considered. Throughout all of Japan everyone was silent. Every hero, villain, and civilian was quiet as they heard the news. Some even felt conflicted when they heard that. Someone who was labeled a criminal could become a figurehead greater than all might. Some people found the idea appeasing, others not so much, but because of Nezu's statement, things were starting to stir. A sharp smile was slowly growing on the man's face. His ideal world where only heroes like All Might was coming true, it all began with a 15-year-old boy who would remove the stains of corrupted heroes from Japan, and eventually the world. Tightening the mask over his face, the man that had a small nose looked over Hasu City, the place where he was certain he would find Izuku Midoriya. On other news, a new vigilant called Paper Bag Man has stopped several crimes today. Abruptly informed the new reporter, Sensei had gotten fed up of listening to the bullshit that had been sprouted on the other station, hoping to find something more interesting, and he had. Not much is known about this new vigilant, other than he will appear where he is needed most. Amazedly gasped the reporter, Izuku pursed his lips as he saw a blurry image of the newest vigilant. The yellow eyes and the suit was a giveaway. What's up with the people I know doing crazy stuff? The wilderedly whined sensei, it was incredibly easy for both of them to realize that it was Kurajiri, and it was an amazement nobody else had connected the dots yet. They've been around your crazy for so long, it's affecting them. Bluntly responded Izuku, not even missing a beat, knowing that at some point the man beside him would get revenge in some petty way. Back on business, we've bought a single apparent building for now, and we can hold just shy of 40 people. We're trying to help the children, but also anyone who living on the street and can't get a job because of their quirk. Seriously stated Izuku, Sensei was apparently creating legal job opportunities for people, and Izuku was scared to ask how. I've been investing into various companies with the money I have. Soon due to investment, we'll have our own income of money and I've been creating job opportunities. Awkwardly informed Sensei, the lights flicker overhead, making Izuku squint suspiciously at the man. Not everything I do is illegal, I didn't jaywalk when we met Chisaki. Defensively huffed Sensei, for some strange reason Izuku couldn't believe him, almost as if he had done something illegal recently. Your standards are low, if it were anyone else I'd be concerned, but I know you spend most of your time watching anime. Weeb, exasperatedly sighed Izuku, watching as Sensei clutched his heart, almost as if Izuku had stabbed him. Before Sensei could even rebuke, the door to the bar rattled slightly, making both S-class criminals freeze slightly as they heard the jingling of keys, both wearily looking at the other, before the door opened. A bundle of white joy dashed into the room, causing all weariness that had built up disappear in an instant, as Yuri had a smile on her face, while Kirajiri trailed in after her. I have gotten Iri some clothing and toiletries, along with some games and toys. Emotionlessly informed Kurajiri, being on the receiving end of two suspicion stares from your friends was worrying. But Kurajiri knew that they knew. Any comments on what happened? I'll warp you and your bed out into the middle of the ocean. Bluntly commented Kurajiri. Did either men believe Kurajiri? Absolutely not. But to make the man feel better, neither commented. A smile grew on Izuku's face as he watched Yuri happily eating an apple that Kurajiri had gotten her. The girl had been absolutely terrorized of what had happened to her. None of them truly knew what had happened, other than the fact that her arms were heavily scarred and a lot of blood was missing. Sensei had used a quirk that suppressed most of the more horrible memories and feelings, though it could only be used once a month on the same person, and it would only last a week at most. How are you liking your apple, Uri? Soothingly hummed Izuku, watching as the red-eyed girl gave a soft smile towards him, followed by a small nod of enjoyment. Her quirk, rewind, is incredibly powerful. From what she said, she's erased her father from existence, who was most likely in his late 20s to early 30s. That means that she could heal someone from a disease illness or wound, but if it's a genetic problem then it will simply come back. Mentally theorized Izuku, he hadn't seen her quirk in action, he simply knew what the girl had told him, but Izuku needed her help with something. Healing Sensei the man was the boogeyman of the underworld. He had killed people and had done many horrible deeds, yet Izuku wanted to save him, despite all of the horrible things he had done, and Izuku wasn't sure if that was the good thing to do. Sensei had planned on removing his scarred face with overhaul, taking the time to do so tests so he could get an accurate description of how his face was doing, the man wasn't certain if he had eyes or not, so Sensei wanted to wait. Part of it was selfless for wanting to save his life, the other part was on a more selfish part. Izuku wanted to save the man for another reason, his power and his quirk, which practically guaranteed safety from people who'd be after him. Izuku wasn't a fool, the Yakuza were most likely after his head, that meant that there was the one with Chisaki and then the one where Izuku had accidental gotten too arrested. It's nice, softly mumbled Iri, she was still incredibly shy due to her upbringing, which made Izuku want to punch Chisaki in the face, with a rock, along with a car running into the man. That's good. Happily sighed Izuku, meanwhile he was nervously sweating on the inside as he realized how dark his thoughts had been. But Kurajiri had agreed with him about the statement, and Izuku couldn't help but think. 
They wanted Ari for her quirk. So think Izuku, think. Mentally chastised the teen, walking away from Ari and sitting back down at the bar, grunting slightly as he rubbed his head. Eradicating quirk. Rewind. Green eyes snapped open, pieces of the puzzle that had previous been out of Izuku's reach were falling into place, making the teen softly gulp before looking at the two other men. The Yakuza had been forced to become what they were today, meaning that some of the members would still think the same despite quirks appearing, and they would want to make things back like the olden days. He wanted to use Iri's quirk to rewind human genetics so they'd be quirkless. Stiffly gasped Izuku, he could hear the way Iri stiffened slightly, further confirming Izuku's sudden realization, and Izuku could feel the stare Sensei and Kurajiri were giving him. Shisaki, he was using Iri's blood, quirk to create a way of erasing, destroying someone's quirk permanently. That's why Iri's arms have so many scars, in the way she lacked blood. Isn't that right, Uri? Softly whispered Izuku, beyond mortified that someone would do that to a little girl. And all three men looked at the girl, who was close to tears. A small nod of her head was all that was needed. Anyone want to help me legally destroy the Yakuza? Bluntly questioned Kurajiri, already handing Izuku a knife, which the teen accepted without question, before pausing in confusion at why he was so willingly accepting the knife. What's the plan? Hesitantly asked Kirajiri, looking between Sensei who was foaming at the mouth, and Izuku who was mumbling a plan at high speeds. Sir Naida, he monitors the area that Chisaki's Yakuza is in. We'll need to inform him of the legal matters. Awkwardly hummed Izuku, looking at Sensei, who was already doing something, and Izuku already knew it was less than legal. Do I want to know what you are doing? Hesitantly asked Izuku, sewing the man pause, since he was doing something with the laptop. I'm gathering data on each member, then checking their search histories. Quickly answered Sensei, the man's face had a charming smile on it, one that looked like it was crafted by Leo the Ratman, a famous artist that had been born three decades ago. Kurajiri, do you mind? Calmly asked Izuku, holding out his hand for Iri, and the girl didn't waste a second in waddling up to him. A small gleam in her eyes as she was aware of what was happening underneath her meek exterior. She wanted revenge. Izuku, excitedly roared all for one, slamming through Izuku's bedroom door, making the teen slowly open up his eyes, staring at Sensei, waiting for the man to apologize for waking him up at three in the morning. Sensei, please, just let me sleep. Exhaustively whined Izuku, borderline crying at this point, just wanting to experience some form of normalcy in his life, after actively bullshitting his way through with Nezu. Being the quirkless guy in class sounds a lot more fun now. Sadly realized Izuku, knowing that at least he wouldn't be treated like some mastermind, whose intelligence rivaled Nezu's own, and that mouse, dog, bear thing was in the top three smartest people in existence. Even sleep later, this is incredibly important, since it involves you. Immediately answered Sensei, easily lifting the teen out of his bed, and began prancing out of the room, happily making his way towards the stairs. You've gotten your first stalker or fan, but either way, it is your first one. Amusedly chuckled Sensei, unaware of the expression on Izuku's face, he looked like he had just been kicked in the balls. Can we not do this in the morning? Like when I'm presentable. Curiously asked Izuku, not sure if Sensei realized how disturbing it sounded, not realize how creepy he was acting since he potentially had a stalker. Oh my boy, it is time you started assembling your generals, the ones who will help you create a better society. Proudly declared Sensei, leaping down all of the stairs into the bar, letting Izuku go in the process, allowing him to fly. Gravity, Izuku's sweet, hard friend requainted him with the wooden flooring a brief few seconds later, making the teen bounce once across the floor, before slamming into the wall, halting all momentum. Slowly, Izuku peeled himself off of the horrible brick wall, one that was in desperate need of wallpaper at this point, hell the entire bar could do with some renovations. Heck, it's actually him. It's actually the equalizer. Giddily screeched the fan, stalker, latching onto Izuku like an iron clamp a split second later, wild blonde hair filling his vision a second later, and Izuku could feel something soft and warm against his chest. I really regret getting some Diet Coke now. Distantly mulled Izuku, everything would be normal if he hadn't gave in to his cravings. He would be at home with his mom, doing homework, and maybe even relaxing. Ooh, dumbly moaned Izuku, his eyes wildly glaring around the room, landing on Sensei, who slowly gave him the thumbs up. After an uncomfortably long hug by his fan, Stalker did they finally pull back, allowing Izuku to see the person, who had decided it was a good idea to wake people up at three in the morning. Izuku had realized that at some point in his observation of his fan, stalker his jaw had dropped, since he had finally done it, he had hugged a girl. The first thing Izuku realized about the pretty, petite, pale girl was that she was blushing and smiling at him. She had yellow eyes that reminded Izuku of a cat, and had lower canines are more pointed and longer than the rest of her teeth. Her hair was a pale, dirty ash blonde and was up in two messy buns, with numerous strands wildly point out of them. She wore a simple oversized, beige sweater that went down to her knees and a pair of sandals with socks. I don't know how I should feel. Mentally cried Izuku, she was incredibly pretty and possibly a real-life cat girl, which he loved the idea of, but she wore socks with sandals, which was a huge no in anyone's book. Oh, what should I call you miss? Politely asked Izuku, he couldn't be rude to the first person who looked somewhat normal, Iri didn't count since she was too cute, but Sensei and Kurajiri were fair game. 
Himiko Toga or Himiko Midori if you want to. Cheerfully introduced the girl, Izuku nodded along in understanding for a brief moment, before freezing up and looking at Sensei. Emergency meeting. Dramatically roared Izuku, springing over towards Sensei, and started pulling the man towards the back door, neither acknowledging Kirajiri as he rose up from behind the bar. May I get you a drink, or something to eat? You're looking awfully thin, and it is nice to finally have someone here Izuku's age. Relievedly moaned Kirajiri, wearing a pair of blue and white pajamas, even having a small sleeping hat on top of his misty head. Girl, stressfully shouted Izuku, pointing back towards the closed door, silently regretting not putting on a pair of shoes, but he wasn't going to admit it aloud. Very good, you can recognize genders, but be careful not to assume anything, you could offend someone if they identify as something else. Softly chastised Sensei, fully aware of what Izuku was talking about, but liked the fact that Izuku's face was as red as his was after his fight with All Might. Cat girl, softly mumbled Izuku, hoping that a pair of cat ears were actually in the girl's messy hair, but accepted it when Sensei just shrugged at him. She wore socks and sandals. I thought seeing Boku no Pico was bad, and you were ugly, but I've never seen something so wrong before. Honestly gasped Izuku, certain that he would rather run from the police again, rather than looking at the ultimate evil. Socks and sandals. Ouch, that actually hurt. Disappointedly sighed Sensei, shivering slightly in the cold air of the morning, wondering why he was actually up to answer the door at this time, or why he had let someone into their secret base so easily. Listen, she randomly showed up, hugged me, was trying to take my last name, and Sensei, I know this might surprise you, but this is my first time talking to or hugging a girl who isn't my mom. Slowly spoke Izuku, pinching himself to make sure he wasn't dreaming, and so far Izuku wasn't sure if it was a dream or a nightmare. H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A. Heartily bellowed Sensei, laughing hard for a solid minute before heaving, almost throwing up as tears streamed down his face, making Izuku step back just in case the man did. Wait, you're serious? Abruptly asked Sensei, pursing his lips as multiple quirks told him that Izuku was serious, and he was scared. Deathly serious. Exasperatedly answered Izuku, pinching the bridge of his nose before walking back inside, locking the door behind him as Sensei's haunting laughter echoed behind him. Stomping his way back through the small apartment complex, Izuku knew what he had to do. He had been doing it ever since he had joined the League of Villain whose new name is under construction. That was for him to remain a poker face, bullshit, and hope that things go somewhat successfully. It only took a few seconds for Izuku to navigate his way through the increasing familiar layout of the apartment, bar, not hesitating as he stood behind the door that would lead to the bar. A loud rattling sound echoed through the air as the door opened up. Izuku remained silently as he watched the old door fall off of its hinges, clattering against the ground a second later. Emerald green eyes slowly turned to lemon yellow eyes, which quickly widened as they stared into Izuku's eyes, and Izuku didn't even question why Toga reeled backwards. Nodding at Kurajiri, Izuku appreciates it as the man silently warped himself out of the room, leaving Izuku to interrogate Toga. How do people interrogate properly? Curiously mulled Izuku, walking over to the bar and taking a seat at one of the many stools, which just happened to be as far away from Toga as possible. Okay, how did you find this place? Calmly began Izuku, he mined a mess as dozens of possible questions started his mind. I followed you, immediately answered Toga, worrying Izuku just a bit at the answer, but he appreciated how quick she answered and how honest she was. Do you want to join the, the equalization? Interestedly questioned Izuku, happy to finally have an official name for the organization, since they would be taking down a Yakuza soon enough. Yes, 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 I want to join, I want to be by your side. Excitedly screeched Toga, getting up out of her chair and lunging at Izuku, a glimmer of something that reflected light was the only warning he got. I want to become you, crazily announced Toga, thrusting her knife forward, while Izuku simply reeled backwards slight, his face unchanging. So far I'm not liking your attitude. Disappointedly sighed Izuku, ignoring Toga as he reached out over the bar, and picked up notepad and pen, watching Toga as she stoked mid-step. I think I'll start writing my will, silently decided Izuku, immediately beginning to scribble stuff down on the first page, surprised when Toga dropped the knife to the ground and sat back down in her original seat. Silence conquered the room, the remorse and sorrow in her eyes was enough for Izuku to realize that she didn't mean it, that something wasn't right with her. She needed help, and Izuku, as a guy who wanted to be a hero for everyone, he would help her. Taking from the way you said that, you suffer from quirk insanity, don't you? Distantly questioned Izuku, aware of Toga meeting his gaze for a brief moment, before nodding in confirmation. And I'm taking it has to do with an aspect of your quirk, that requires you to consume something from another human to activate. Rhetorically questioned Izuku, ripping off the first page of the notebook and crunching it in his hands, immediately beginning to write down what he knew so far. Quirk insanity, it started popping up sometime around the second generation of quirks, and it was rare back then, but it was slowly becoming more common with each passing generation, and becoming worse. Quirk insanity forced the person to do stuff that they wouldn't want to do, making them consume people in Toga's case, and it eventually lead to the person becoming a monster, harming anyone and anything. 
There were methods to hell with quirk and sanity. Therapy and waning people off of their addictions was the best bet, but it was a 50-50 chance of it being successful. Do you want to harm people? Soothingly asked Izuku, dropping everything in his hands and making his way over towards Toga, placing a hand on her shoulder, and looked her in the eyes. I don't, pitifully wailed Toga, throwing herself at Izuku in a messy hug, and began crying, shivering as she cried into Izuku's chest, as the teen slowly wrapped her in his arms. I wanted to be a hero, but, 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 desperately stammered Toga, trying to explain herself, but Izuku simply hushed her. It's okay now, I am here for you, softly promised Izuku, now not feeling so annoyed at being awoken at three in the morning, since he was now saving someone. I'll have Kirajiri prepare a room for you, I'm going to need my newest and most trustworthy friend to be prepared when they wake up at a reasonable time. Gently hummed Izuku, stroking her hair as she cried, remembering back when he was younger. His mother did this for him when he was told he was quirkless. Thank you, breathlessly gasped Toga, staying in his arms as her breathing eventually calmed down, as Izuku was forced to stand and support her since she had fallen asleep. Hopefully Kirajiri or Sensei will help. Tiredly hoped Izuku, waiting patiently for either Kirajiri or Sensei to enter the bar and help him set up a room for her. Slowly minutes started ticking by, one minute became two minutes, and two became five, and Izuku realized something very impressive after the ten minute mark. Neither are helping and I've no idea where the spare pillows and blankets are. Calmly concluded Izuku, pursing his lips in annoyance as he realized that he would have to give up his bed for tonight, and possibly sleep in one of the booths for tonight. <laughs> Greetings everyone. Lai Ren back here to give you the latest update of Japan's manhunt on Deku, or Aka Izuku Midoriya, the Equalizer. Happily chirped Lai Ren, Izuku grumbled in annoyance as he rubbed the sleep from his eyes, well aware that he was running on a few hours, but that's where coffee would help. Recently, Chisaki of the Yakuza has come forth and claimed that a mysterious man and Deku have cornered him and took his daughter. Loudly gasped Lai Ren, a loud thud echoing through the bar as Izuku slammed his head against the table. You look kind of tired, Izuku, long night. Smugly chuckled Sensei, receiving the middle finger from Izuku, as the teen knew his day was going to be a mess since Kurajiri was still gone. Sensei, do you have any books to do with quirk and sanity? Bluntly asked Izuku, nursing his cup of coffee as he sat back up, his green eyes exhausted as he stared at where Sensei's eyes should be. I take it that girl suffers from it, but why ask me? Lazily answered Sensei, looking up at the TV, which now had photos of Izuku, Chisaki, and Ari, who was still in her room asleep, not that Izuku was jealous or anything. You've hundreds, if not thousands of quirks, so the chances of you not suffering from a mild dose of quirk insanity is unlikely. Logically pointed out Izuku, well aware that he should be planning a raid against Chisaki's gang, but he had more important things to do. Get the apartment complex up and running, help Sensei create more job opportunities, and help Toga, they weren't in any order of importance, but if they were, Toga would be at the top. You're right, and I've gone through the issue of emailing you some reliable sources, even the doctor's email address. Through as far as he knows you've an intelligence-boosting quirk, so just don't mention you're quirkless or anything if you do meet him. Nonchalantly answered Sensei, smiling to himself, while Izuku sat there miffed. I never gave you my email address, slowly informed Izuku, perplexed by the fact that Sensei's smile only getting larger as the man pulled out a phone from his pocket. I made one for you, equalizer 69420 at TLOV. Proudly announced Sensei, throwing the phone at Izuku, who sat there wide-eyed, not even registering it when the phone hit his face. He seems to be at a loss for words at how kind you are. Dryly observed Kurajiri, popping up from behind the counter a second later, now wearing his normal suit. My future relies on idiots. Emotionally thought Izuku, not bothering to hide the tears as they streamed down his face, gingerly picking up his new phone a moment later. See, I'm still hop with the kids. Giddily chuckled Sensei, if only he knew how wrong he actually was, since Izuku would rather fight All Might in his prime rather than ever hear those words leave Sensei's lips again. If only legally taking down the Yakuza didn't take so long. Okay class, listen up. Tiredly commanded Shota Aizawa, more commonly known as the pro hero Eraserhead, or by Aizawa Sensei from his students, who were all frozen beneath his glare. Nezu thought it would be a good idea for every class to be briefed on the villain known as Izuku Midoriya, Aka the Equalizer, or Deku. Exasperatedly informed Aizawa, seeing the majority of the class stiff and slight, though he couldn't help but feel disturbed by the smile on Shoto Todoroki's face. After hitting my father with a car and a fire extinguisher, he is all right in my book. Mentally spoke Shoto, his mismatched eyes scanning the class, before discreetly looking down at the phone resting on his lap. That damn Deku played me like a fiddle. Loudly roared Katsuki Bekugo, explosions roaring from his palms, as Aizawa trying to pinch the bridge of his nose, already knowing this would be a long day. Izuku Midoriya, age 15, he possesses a quirk that boosts his intelligence to the point of putting him on par or above Nezu's own who's currently second in terms of intelligence. Calmly announced Aizawa, watching some of the students shudder, since it was their homework to watch Nezu perform tasks that rival a supercomputer, though his eyes landed on Momo, whose hand was up. 
Sir, why is he so much more dangerous than normal villains? Curiously questioned Momo, who already knew the answer, but knew that most of her classmates wouldn't, Akamina and Denki. Mainly because he is smart, he hides and plans things out to a T, and the fact he has been known to make incredibly complex notes on quirks that he has only had a few seconds to recognize is truly what makes him dangerous. He is intelligent and cunning. Softly hummed Aizawa, his eyes hardening as he saw some of his students not paying attention. Normally, underground heroes like me would be tasked with his takedown, but that won't be used this time, since he has notes on every one hero in Japan, new and retired. Grimly informed Aizawa, recalling his first time visiting the evidence room that contained everything known about Izuku Midoriya. Sixteen physical notebooks that contained detailed information about each hero, their patrol routes, quirks, parents, relationships, names, weaknesses, strengths, ideal and unidle environments. Aizawa couldn't help but shudder if Izuku Midoriya wasn't treated as a second-class citizen. He would definitely be a hero that anyone could admire. What scared Aizawa was that the notebooks were just the very beginning of the rabbit hole now known as the Information Pit, with hundreds of folders found on his computer, with notes on heroes. All Might was the most common one found, with speculations about what his quirk was, and Izuku Midoriya had figured out All Might's major problem. His time limit, which was accompanied by a graph that predicted his time limit for the following few months, with it reaching zero just before Christmas time of this year if he didn't push himself. Izuku's new phone buzzed once, followed by a second buzz, making the teen put his book down, grabbing it and turn it towards him out of reflex. Seeing two notifications from Yumail coming in on his phone, one of the pre-added contacts in the phone, and the other one Izuku knew was vaguely familiar. Doctor and Shoto Todoroki, the first one he knew, but the second one was most likely Endeavor's son or something. Someone has found my email address, and it's Endeavor's son. Slowly noted Izuku, still somewhat annoyed by the fact Toga and Iri were both still asleep. How did he get it? Emotionlessly questioned Izuku, staring down the most dangerous and fearsome villain in history. Cool, answer it, you'd be rude not to. Half-heartedly answered Sensei, choosing to ignore Izuku's second question while typing away at his laptop. For a reason unknown to Izuku, against all better judgment and ignoring what his mind was telling him, Izuku clicked on the email by Shoto Todoroki and help his breath as it loaded up. Name, Shoto Todoroki. Heading, thank you. Message, thank you for hitting my dad with your car, I'm a fan, and if you want to ruin Endeavor's career message me. I have proof of domestic abuse, he has also killed my oldest brother before I was born. It would mean a lot if you could do something about it. Rereading the text once again, Izuku's eyes were furiously scanning the message over and over again, trying to pick up any form of lie in it, which was kinda of hard since it was a text. If this was true, then this could be the first huge thing that the equalization, showing the world that heroes just aren't their quirks, that they are capable of being true villains. Hey sensei, the first thing we should do is prove that a hero isn't a hero because they have a heroic quirk, yeah. Slowly asked Izuku, a plan for the immediate future was coming to mind, one that was quite achievable. Help Toga with her quirk insanity, expose Endeavor, fix up the apartment complex and find people who are misjudged because of their quirk to line there, and destroy Chisaki. Mentally organized Izuku, nodding to himself in acceptance, since he never liked Endeavor anyway. Yep, make them question society itself as a whole, and you should probably announce your plans on doing good, like letting me explode Chisaki's place. Dismissively scoffed Sensei, Izuku nodded along with that, though exploding the place might make it a bit more difficult to prove that he was a good guy. Sending a message back to Shoto Todoroki, Izuku gave the guy a time, place, to bring all of the necessary information, and to come alone. Accepting that he was in fact, about to be starting his huge plan to redeem his name, and show off that he was a good guy, and not a villain. Now it is time to ready up on quirk insanity, and to apply for a course in therapy. Happily hummed Izuku, finished reading over everything he needed to know about how to be a therapist. All he had to do was specialize in quirk insanity, and he would be a legally qualified therapist as soon as he finished the course. Kurajiri warped onto the rooftop of one of the many buildings. His vision was slightly impaired thanks to the paper bag on his face, meaning he would have to make some changes to it later, but for now he must deal with it. Crouching on top of ledge of the building, Kurajiri smiled beneath his mask. Something inside of him felt right saving people, like he had been going against it his entire life. Oh my god, he is going to jump. Quick, someone call a hero, loudly roared one of the passing civilians, making a havoc down on the streets below, as hundreds of people stopped what they were doing and took out their phones. I can't do one cool thing without me looking stupid. Disappointedly mulled Kurajiri, standing up tall, hearing the nervous gasps from the street below. I am not going to jump, please do not call the police. Calmly announced Kurajiri, hoping that this would persuade the crowd to leave, so he could go back to saving people. He said he was going to jump. Dramatically wailed the same civilian, obviously not hearing the knot in his response, while more people started gathering beneath him. Paper bag man might retire soon enough. Mentally accepted Kurajiri, gathering mist within his hands and was ready to step over the edge and open up a portal, only for a hand to grab his shoulder. Don't jump you've so much to live for, don't you? 
blatantly shouted a man who was dressed in leather and reminded Kurajiri of an exotic parrot whose hair was a mess. I'm not going to, sadly sighed Kurajiri, pausing for a second at how someone else would take then, more specifically that he won't have something to live for. Don't you want to do something then? Soothing asked present Mike, slowly guiding Kurajiri away from the edge, even though he just wanted to pose for a little while. I wanted to be a hero. Reminiscently gasped Kurajiri, his head hurting as this scene almost felt familiar for some reason, almost as if he knew this man and had been asked the same question before. I can help you with that. There's a one-day course, it is only a 0.001% pass rate, but we'll get you to be a hero in no time. Proudly informed present Mike, happily dragging Kurajiri towards the door so he could take him to the test site, which would be starting in a few hours. Lai Renier again, reporting the heroic save by present Mike, saving the former vigilant paper bag man who is now known as the Warp Hero, Bagman. Cheerfully repeated Lai Ren, for what Izuku counted to be the twelfth time within the hour, as he stared down Kurajiri, who at least had the decency to remove his mask. Listen, if you have been feeling so down lately, you could talk to me, I'm here for you. Sadly chastised Izuku, somewhat jealous by the fact that Kurajiri had accidentally achieved the same thing he has wanted to do since he was four. He's a therapist in training, and he's studying online. Proudly huffed Sensei, exaggeratedly wiping a tear away, even though he didn't have eyes, or tear ducts for that matter. Apples, gently asked Eri, childishly holding her hands up to the bar, watched as two apples floated into the air, and as the apples were skinned and sliced into peace. Thank you, Sensei. Gratefully appreciated Eri, as a plate flew up from beneath the bar, landing in Eri's hands, shortly followed by all the apple slices organizing them on her plate. No problem, softly grumbled Sensei. Izuku did not miss the small blush of embarrassment on the man's face, storing the information for a later date. Have you all eaten breakfast yet? I can cook something for everyone, and even Toga. Immediately questioned Kurajiri, not wanting to talk about how he accidentally became a hero, nor about how he felt, since he felt fine. Oh, western food at 10 in the morning. Not good for my cholesterol, but I can make an exception since Izuku has made two allies today. Gleefully cheered Sensei, making Izuku slam his face against the table. We can't stay on track for more than a minute, and from the stories I've gathered about Sensei's past, he was a monster, and now he is acting embarrassed when a little girl say thanks. Mentally hummed Izuku, shaking his head since he was certain he would eventually hear Sensei's story, which was something that he was looking forward to. A creak coming from upstairs made Izuku blink, looking at the stairs as they started growing from the stress of being stepped on, really reminding Izuku to get this place up to safety standards. Toga emerged from the stairs a few seconds later, her hair an absolute mess, with bags beneath her sunken eyes and dried tear stains on her cheek. Hey, Deli greeted Toga, slumping down onto one of the seats furthest away from Izuku, planting her face against the table and sighed, going still a moment later. So shall we begin now, or do you want to eat breakfast first? Curiously greeted Izuku, dropping a mountain load of books on the table, each related to actual therapy and others' books contain knowledge on quirk and sanity. Are you qualified? Slowly asked Toga, pulling herself up until she was sitting normally, eyeing Izuku as the teen looked almost professional, if he wasn't wearing an extra-large All Might hoodie that looked like a dress. I'm a quick study, vaguely answered Izuku, knowing that sometimes Hiro mustn't say the truth, that saying a little white lie is better than letting someone know the truth. I'm more qualified than anyone else who would claim to be a therapist and want to help her out of the good of their heart. Grimly mauled Izuku, feeling sick that he would think such a thing, but he has grown a lot ever since the accident. The world was not black or white, just gray, with some shades darker than others, and some light than others, but there was no such thing as a person who was completely good or bad. All Might has done bad things in the past and Sensei has done good things as well, while Izuku did his best to be good and help others. My therapist is the equalizer himself. Giddily realized Toga, feeling the smile grow on her face as she realized that this will help her in so many ways, and she might even be able to become a normal girl again. Toga's goals were, get help, which were done, cure her quirk insanity, which was underneath process. Lastly but most important, get Izuku to be hers. Yep, excitedly squealed Toga, watching in excitement as Izuku took out a notebook, ready to take down the answers Toga would hopefully give him, since Izuku already had a few vague ideas on what her addiction could be. Katsuki bristled as he stormed down the hallways of UA, heading towards the male's toilets, where he would hopefully be able to take out his phone and do something in peace. The scowl on his face was bad enough to make a baby cry, and Katsuki felt it was warranted since he had been told not to engage Izuku Midori under any circumstance, since he would lose. Stupid Deku, lowly growled Katsuki, bewildered by the fact that this whole incident was being blown out of proportion. Izuku Midori was a quirkless wimp, who couldn't even plan out his future, and definitely didn't know how to plan out what the hell he was currently doing. 
I am going to prove that this shit is being blown out of the water, determinedly snapped Katsuki, well aware of the fact that he could get into a lot of trouble if he was caught, but the rewards outweigh the risks. Katsuki's plan was simple but genius in his mind, hit up each possible location that Izuku had some form of attachment to, and search the area, hopefully finding a clue or something. If not then he would repeatedly visit the area until he found something else. Simple but foolproof, there was no way Izuku could manage staying away from his house for so long, or the beach that was basically a dump. Dagaba Beach at 6 in the evening. Quietly mumbled someone behind Katsuki, making the teen squint since the voice was somewhat familiar, it definitely belonged to a classmate of his. Why? Confusedly gawked Katsuki, blinking as half naff walked past him, with a phone in his hand as he walked past him, not even acknowledging Katsuki as he walked by. Katsuki would later regret letting his curiosity get the best of him. It was actually nice having a girl nearby now, it had lead to a lot of questions the moment Toga had seen his disguise room, which was really just a room that had been converted into a large closet, that had a makeup table, and a few hundred wigs in it. What was more awkward was actually doing Toga's makeup, since it involved touching a girl's face, which was something Izuku had never done before. I'm just doing a light foundation, with a bit of blush and eyeshadow. Slowly decided Izuku, it had just turned five in that evening, and he was scheduled to meet up with his client soon enough, and with Kirajiri's help, he would be there in seconds. At least I'm already prepared. Distantly noted Izuku, having been forced to prepare for hours beforehand, since he had to cover up the bags beneath his eyes and his freckles. So how did you become so good at makeup? Curiously hummed Toga, puffing out her cheeks as Izuku gently patted them with a soft rose blush. There was no reason for her to wear makeup, but she wanted to be by Izuku longer. YouTube, and this isn't my first time disguising myself. Distractedly answered Izuku, gesturing at the current clothing he was wearing, which was definitely something he was slowly becoming accustomed to wearing. I think you look pretty cute, bluntly admitted Toga, not being afraid to brush her right hand across Izuku's face, and even try to pull him closer to her so she could steal something. Taking a step back once he was done applying Toga's makeup, oblivious to the fact that Toga had leaned in closer to him with her lips plucked, nodding himself at how well her makeup had turned out. Brushing back a lock of ebony black hair, Izuku rolled his eyes as he wouldn't call himself cute, edgelord would be more appropriate more than anything. Currently Izuku wore a black wig that was spiky and wild, which matched the cliché black top that had a skull on it. Izuku also wore a choker, a pair of spiked wristbands, a black pair of cargo trousers, which had a knife and flashbang in it, and a pair of black combat boots, which added an additional three inches to his height. I prefer the term edgelord, proudly declared Izuku, trying to fit into the persona he was trying to create for this appearance, before pausing as his phone buzzed, pulling it out of one of the many pockets, and taking a glance at it. Cool, I'm joining the drama club soon. Happily hummed Izuku, since acting could prove to be a vital skill at one point. So what's the plan for your client? Are you going in alone, or will I be shadowing you? Curiously inquired Toga, standing as up as Izuku started walking out of the room, probably gathering some last-minute supplies he would need. Nah, Kurajiri will be perched on one of the buildings, and will open up a gate to him if anything happens. Casually dismissed Izuku, noting when Toga caught up to him and started uncomfortably close to him, but from what Izuku knew about her past, she needed someone she could rely on. Toga was prone to making poor choices, and she had chosen him, another poor choice on her behalf. Why are you so eager about this anyway? Idly questioned Toga, wanting to get to know Izuku better, she wanted to know him inside and out, but not by cutting him open. Izuku squinted as he tried recalling the many reasons why he didn't like Endeavor. A few cases he was on definitely came to mind, like the one where Endeavor stormed a drug ring, seriously burning everyone inside, even killing two. What Endeavor had done to Shoto was definitely what had tipped the scales. Izuku had just been given the bare bones of the situation, but it was enough to make anyone hate the man. He abused two children, he's killed multiple innocent and otherwise people, and forced the woman of his children to marry him, in return he would pay off a life-saving operation that would cost millions. Absent-mindedly listed Izuku, his eyes flying open as he gripped onto Toga's shoulders and wrapped her in a hug a moment later, feeling the girl tense up. He was aware of what he was doing, he could control himself but chose not to. Immediately whispered Izuku, doing his best to console the girl as he hugged her, aware on just how delicate her mental state was. Thank you, gently whispered Toga, wrapping her arms beneath Izuku's own, latching onto his shoulders afterward, pulling him as close to her as physically possible. Shoto sat on one of the many benches that dotted the beach, calling it a beach was a bit generous, since it was more like a dump than anything else, with the mountains of garbage on front of him. Shoto's left leg was uncontrollably bouncing up and down, he had been here for an hour at this point, having to run home beforehand and actually compile a hard dive of evidence for Izuku Midoriya. More than once Shoto had thought about leaving, it was practically suicide to go and meet any villain that was in a rank and think nothing bad would happen, and it was worse since it was Izuku Midoriya. Though the thoughts of finally getting revenge for what his father has done to him, his mother, and his family was what made him stay. What is this half naff bastard even doing here? Confusedly thought Katsuki, leaning against one of the many buildings that littered the edge of the beach, business was poor but they somehow managed to stay open. 
There was a bit more than two decades of evidence, photos, receipts, and videos on the small hard drive that was in his trousers pocket, which would be more than enough to get Endeavor in trouble, even if he was the number two hero. Shoto knew if he got out it he would be in huge trouble. He would lose his place at UA, as well as so much trouble with his father, if he didn't get busted instantly. It is a horrible place, isn't? Piles of trash, some are tall enough to be called mountains, disgusting. Softly spat a voice on Shoto's left, making the teen tense up a bit, startled by the sudden appearance of the black-haired stranger on his left, not even sure when he had appeared. Did he not notice me? Isn't he a hero in training? Confusedly thought Izuku, his mind rapidly coming to the conclusion that this guy relied on brute force and not finer control. That's the signal. Mentally noted Shoto, it was a metaphor to society. The heroes who were like Endeavor stood above everyone else, towering above them like a mountain, though they were trash and had to be removed. Truly disgusting. It is about time someone does something about it, yes. Curiously asked Shoto, glancing as red eyes squinted as the person adjusted the choker on their neck, their eyes meeting for a moment. Yep, it's why I hired the dump service to deal with this. Idly announced Izuku, gesturing at the dump trucks that started driving by. Since they had been in favor of doing this, apparently the beach held a few memories to him as well. Wait, are you not Izuku Midoriya? Confusedly asked Shoto, he felt like they had been talking about the same thing. Talking about how society was being suffocated by trashy heroes, covering the good ones, and the trash had to be removed. If you don't tell anyone about our meeting, then I am Izuku. Do you have the evidence? Slowly spoke Izuku, confused to why Shoto would actually ask that question, since he had just been talking about the poor state of the beach. Yes, how soon will it take for you to ruin Endeavor's life and career? Immediately stated Shoto, taking the hard drive out of his pocket and held it out to Izuku, abruptly feeling shaky about the whole ordeal. Definitely before the sports festival. It is now just a matter of finding a reporter who we can trust enough to get this information out. If not, I have my ways. Idly answered Izuku, doing his best to remain in characters. Watching as dozens of men continued to clean up the beach, it was amazing what people would do when they were being paid for it. Thank you. It means a lot. That man hasn't just ruined my life, but my whole family's life as well. Honestly thanked Shoto, freezing as Izuku accepted the hard drive out of his hand, his quirk almost activating as the villain lightly grabbed his hand. If you ever need a place to stay if your home isn't safe, you can always stay at my hideout. You'll be surrounded by misfits, but I'll be here for you. Truthfully proposed Izuku, stuffing the hard drive into his pocket, standing up and stretching out, nodding once at Shoto. It's been a pleasure Shoto Todoroki, just keep quiet about out meeting okay. Softly hummed Izuku, shoving his hands into his pockets as he walked off, intending on exploring a bit since he was already in disguise. Shoto sat there shell-shocked. He was a hero in training, so he was supposed to stop villains like Izuku, but it felt so right knowing that his father's life and dream would be up in flames before the sports festival. Finally, Endeavor would suffer the backlash of what he has done, ruin so many lives for a selfish manner, even killing his firstborn to achieve his dream of number one. Katsuki stood still at the side of the shop, his nails digging into his palm, a slight trickle of blood dripping down onto his fingers and onto the ground, staining the pavement red with blood. A tremble ran up Katsuki's body as he desperately struggled to keep the scream inside of him. Hours of waiting had lead to this. A goddamn waste. Mentally roared Katsuki, the garbage trucks had been continuously driving past him, and the sound of garbage being thrown into the truck had completely muffled any of the conversation that Shoto had with that stranger. Some would call it coincidence, others would call it fate, Izuku was willing to call it bullshit at this point, since what were the chances he would be sitting in a fast food restaurant, with Nezu happily nibbling on some fries directly beside him. Izuku was certain that Nezu knew it was him, the mouse just wanted him to start talking, but Izuku wasn't a fool, he knew better. Neither of them made eye contact, Izuku calmly bit into his burger as Nezu nibbled on his fries, the silence was awkward, but against his better judgment, Izuku slowly glanced towards Nezu. Emerald Green met Beady Black, both remained silent for a few seconds, before straightening their vision, and Izuku was starting to find it unbearable. Do people treat you differently because of your appearance? Curiously questioned Izuku, blinking when he realized that he didn't even think about what he said, already preparing an apology. The same way people treat you became of your past. Softly answered Nezu, truthfully he had just entered this fast food restaurant because he wanted something quick and easy to eat. It was coincidence and unplanned that he would meet Izuku Midoriya here. As much as he shouldn't, Nezu respected Izuku a great deal because of his intelligence, and more secretly, his goal, the goal to completely reform society so nobody would be based off of their quirk, and be seen for the people they were. That respect had blinded Nezu in a sense, he should be trying to stop Izuku right here and now, not eating a cheap fast food meal with him, and talking about how people treated them because of their appearance. I was thought to be quirkless when I was younger, a guy named Katsuki Bakugo bullied me to the point of telling me to kill myself, all because I never had a quirk. Distantly countered Izuku, well aware of the fact that Katsuki was in UA, and it was his dream to become a hero, but it was time he started answering for his wrongdoings. 
I wonder what it would have been like if I lived a nice childhood. Would we be here having this conversation now? Sadly huffed Izuku. After all that he had experienced since he lived with Sensei and Kurajiri, Izuku liked to think that he had become a lot wiser. Quirks were overrated. If you had one you could either be praised as a hero because you have a powerful quirk, have your existence acknowledged by everyone else since have a decent quirk, or shunned because you had a deemed villainous quirk. If you were unfortunate enough to be born quirkless, some would say you'd be better off dead, since most people couldn't handle the bullying, the mocking, or the target painted on your back because of it. Is that why you walk down this path, simply because you've had a misfortune beginning? Interestedly questioned Nezu, watching as Izuku rolled his eye at the question. Nope, I've always wanted to be a hero. And I guess I am following my dreams now, because I can save the people that heroes don't want to save, simply because they wouldn't get the recognition or fame for doing so. Coily countered Izuku, knowing that there was more than one type of hero out there, that nor every hero stood in the light. I'm starting to ask this question, does your society have more monsters than mine? Mysteriously asked Izuku, pulling out the hard drive and waving it in front of Nezu, watching his eyes follow it. You're an interesting man Izuku, but remember, I will capture you and put you into the deepest possible level of the Tartarus. Idly promised Nezu, about to stand up once again, but halted as he saw Izuku stand up and dash out of the door, not even responding. Rude, he didn't even respond. Disappointedly grumbled Nezu, deciding that he may as well get back to UA and finish organizing the sports festival. Excuse me sir, but you'll have to pay before you leave, and the gentleman sitting beside you asked me to give this to you once left. Politely informed one of the employees, handing Nezu a folded piece of paper, making Nezu squint as he was certain he had paid beforehand. Thank you, cheerfully answered Nezu, opening up the piece of paper and grinned as he read what was on it. Dear Nezu, karma is a pain, and you get to pay for it this time. From your favorite person M. Well played, childishly noted Nezu, wondering when Izuku had set this up, though blanched as he saw trolley after trolley filled with food come towards him, knowing what Izuku had done. Well played indeed, begrudgingly admitted Nezu, at least he would be able to treat his staff to a snack during the meeting this evening. So you know the plan, slowly asked Izuku, feeling as if this was the tenth time going over it, and it wasn't even that complex. I stab her, immediately answered Toga, pulling out a box cutters for added emphasis, watching as Izuku collapsed to the ground with tears streaming down his face as Kirajiri crouched down beside him. Is the fast food not agreeing with you, we don't have to break into her apartment tonight. Soothingly comforted Kirajiri, motherly rubbing Izuku's back, trying to get him to stop crying. It's okay, and Toga no stabbing anyone, we're trying to have a positive encounter with her, since she's out best bet in publishing this. Stressful groaned Izuku, tempted to take the box cutters off of Toga, but knew that it was her comfort her item. Fine, I won't stab her. They grudgingly accepted Toga, unknowingly making tears off relief fall down Izuku's face, instead of the tears of stress that had been falling down a few seconds prior. Oh, the lights are on. Nonchalantly pointed out Toga, making the two males immediately stand up, Kirajiri pulling the paper bag off of his face, now nobody would know he was paper bag man. Kirajiri silently met Izuku's, nodding once Izuku's head subtly nodded at him, holding his left hand forward, causing both a portal to form in front of them and inside of the person's apartment. The plan was simple, find Lai Ren's address, which was done, enter her house and persuade her to publish the data on the hard drive, which would be a bit harder, but Izuku had created a few copies. Hitting the wooden floor with a thunk, Izuku blinked as he saw Toga rocket forward and leap into the air, spinning around elegantly and landing behind Lai Ren as she stared at Izuku with her mouth agape. A loud clatter echoed through the apartment as she dropped the mug in her hand, spilling the contents across the floor. Your Izuku Midoriya, quietly gasped Lai, repeatedly opening and closing her mouth, brushing her brown hair out of her face, blinked slightly as her eyes went from blue to yellow. You're going to kill me, I swear. Whenever I dissed you, I was just reading off of the script. Loudly wailed Lai, Toga didn't waste a second in clamping her hands over her mouth, silencing the woman. I'm not going to kill you, that would ruin my reputation, and you're a reporter and you're looking for the next big thing, yeah. Soothingly promised Izuku, running a hand through his messy hair, trying to recall the tip Sensei had given him when talking to a reporter, pulling out his laptop from his satchel as well as the hard drive. So I want to propose a business deal, you have to write to deny it, and if you do, nothing will happen to you. Truthfully proposed Izuku, snapping open his laptop and plugging the hard drive in, holding his laptop with one hand, while typing. Lai Ren remained silent as Toga let go of her mouth, she was beyond terrified at this point, and her apartment was one of the most dangerous criminals in recorded history, but the reporter in her was more than a bit curious about the offer. It was common knowledge that Izuku Midori operated on a different wavelength compared to other villains, using his words and intelligence instead of grand displays of power. Just a teasers of what's to come. Coily offered Izuku, twisting his laptop around so Lai could see it, smiling as he saw her eyes go from yellow to orange as she read the bit of information. 
All that was on the screen was a photo of Shoto's mother, showing off various bruises on her body, a receipt showing Endeavor's payment for her surgery, the contract for their marriage and what it involved, and most important her administration into the psychiatric ward. Scrolling down just a bit, Izuku knew what was next. It was one of the many videos that showed Endeavor beating his wife. How did you get this? Amazedly asked Lai, leaning in closer to Izuku, trying to get a clearer vision on what was on the laptop. The client wishes to remain silent, but if you do publish it, I want you to say that Izuku Midoriya passed on the information. Calmly spoke Izuku, his eyes not glowing as bright as they normally did, holding a somewhat sinister gleam to them. When we touch our cups off one another we have to say clink. Repeatedly grumbled Sensei, willing to kill the next person who walked through the door if they seen him in his current outfit, and he was only in because Iri needed a princess. Why did I do this again? Mentally hummed Sensei, wearing a Disney princess outfit, Elsa's outfit if memory served him correctly. He even took it a step forward and used one of his transformation quirks. Clink, softly whispered Iri, shyly clinking her fake teacup off of Sensei's own, nervously looked down a second later, only to look up a second later with a small smile on her face as she took a sip from the empty cup. Now I remember, Hiri was bored and persuaded me. Idly recalled Sensei, remember back decades ago when he did the same with one of his little cousins, back when didn't know no he at all for one. I wonder what my life would have been like if I did try and be a hero, instead of trying to save my brother. Furiously thought Sensei, which was the morally right option, giving up on his brother's illness and being a hero like he had dreamed on being, or build an empire and try and save his brother's life. Wow, fine, everyone in the media world loves scandal, but this will blow them away and earn me more than a few promotions. Softly gasped Lai, her eyes glowing orange, Izuku was convinced that her eyes changed color depending on her emotion, despite it never happening when she was live on the news. You got yourself a deal Izuku Midoriya, I'll publish the information you bring to me, and only me exclusively. I should have this published by the day after tomorrow, or if we're lucky, it'll be tomorrow. Cheerfully agreed Lai, sticking her hand out towards Izuku, who fumbled with his laptop for a brief second, before accepting it. Pleasure doing work with you. Happily sighed Izuku, fishing out a copy of the hard drive from his pocket, that contained all the information, handing it to Lai as soon as he had it. You better not let him down, or else he won't be happy. Deli pointed out Toga, mildly upset that she didn't get to stab her, but if she did then Izuku would have been upset with her. If you'll excuse us. Politely hummed Kirajiri, opening up a warp gate and watched as both Izuku and Toga walked through it, staying behind for a few seconds and looking at Lai, making sure she wasn't lying. She was telling the truth, Kirajiri instincts told him that, and he trusted his instincts. Did you ever see something that you didn't want to see? Izuku did, and that was Sensei, a man who was at least 180 years old, minimum, in a Disney princess outfit, getting changed in the bar back into his suit while he was doing something upstairs. Out of his heroic instinct, Izuku raised his left hand up, covering Toga's eyes before she could even see the sight of Sensei, which was oddly disgusting. Now you see me, now you don't, casually said Sensei, disappearing from sight a second later, making Izuku drop his arm down with a depressed look in his eyes. What happened? Confusedly asked Toga, seeing Izuku shrug as he walked over to the bar and picked up the TV remote while Kirajiri walked through his warp gate and closed it. You don't want to know. Exasperatedly sighed Izuku, the sight of a partly undressed sensei in a Disney princess outfit was burned into his mind, but on the bright side, his day definitely couldn't get any worse. Turning on the television, Izuku flicked through the channels, while Kirajiri took his normal place behind the bar, and Toga sat beside him, resting her head on his right shoulder. One channel in particular caught his attention. Izuku froze as he realized why it had caught his attention. It was a photo of him with a perfectly balanced scales in his hands, while standing behind the earth. As you can see, graffiti like this has been popping up all of Musutafu and Hasu City. The surge of crime has become an issue at this point. Now criminal activity is at 10% in Japan, rising 7% since last year's, which is worrying. Loudly shouted the reporter, pointing at the graffiti, with wind and rain loudly going off in the background. The hero killer, Stain, has also pledged his loyalty to Izuku Midoriya. Killing a hero as he did so, is Izuku Midoriya truly as peaceful as we believe to be? Rhetorically asked the reporter, one Izuku didn't know the name of, and at this point he couldn't care, since all of his attempts of redeeming himself had just fallen down the drain. No, softly pined Izuku, slapping his head against the bar, doing it again but a lot more vicious, aware that Toga was currently trembling as she gripped her knife, tears swelling in her eye, making Izuku push aside his own disappointment. Are you okay? Concernedly questioned Izuku, gently grabbing Toga's head until she was looking at him, confused as to why she was crying. He's ruining all of your process, and he is even considering how you feel. Loudly hiccuped Toga, making Izuku's heart clenched, realizing how much he actually meant to Toga, despite only knowing her for a short time. Thorajiri, calmly spoke Izuku, pinching his brow, realizing what he was about to do was completely stupid, and the probability of him getting stabbed was extremely high, like high enough that Izuku would be surprised if he didn't get stabbed. 
Can you prepare me a snack? I'll be busy tonight, and hopefully tomorrow we'll be talking with the hero killer. Softly hummed Izuku, whipping out his laptop and cracked his neck, ready to pull an all-nighter, eyeing the bulletin board in the bar, which was about to be decorated in sticky notes and messily drawn maps. Izuku wouldn't say it aloud, but he was glad he had the chance to meet such great people. Sure, they may have stabbed a person or five, but they had issues that they were now working through, and they wanted to make a change to society. Opening his laptop, Izuku's eyes narrowed slightly as he could see one pop-up notification on the screen, a email by someone he didn't quite recognize. Doctor, that's weird. Confusedly hummed Izuku, opening up the message and reading through it, rubbing his temple as he realized he would definitely be helping a lot of people out with their issues soon enough. Name, Doctor. Title, Why. Message, Hello Izuku Midoriya, I understand that you must be busy with your plans, but it would be nice if my newest comrade paid me a visit. Since I understand that your intelligence rivals, if not surpasses Nezu's own, and I would appreciate a talk with you tomorrow about Nomus, genetically altered humans. Shirajiri knows the coordinates, and please tell all for one to stop spamming that unholy link to me, I have been forced to watch that link too many times. Oh hey, what's that link? Curiously asked Toga, peering over Izuku's shoulder reaching over him and dragging the mouse down to click on it. Warning bells going off in Izuku's head since it seemed familiar, horrifyingly familiar. Wait, horrifiedly yelled Izuku, but unfortunately he was too late, his mind was too slow to remember what the link was, and all he could do was close his eyes as it loaded, there wasn't enough time to stop the horrors that were about to unfold. Koi wo shi yo kisu suraminai. Koi wo shi yomi wo mitsumit. Koi wo dakashimit. Ti wo tsunagumachai no shigenaru. Kawur shunken yuuki wo dashitara. The laptop costed sensei a few thousand yen, but Izuku felt like the man owed him a new laptop. Since Izuku had never thrown his laptop faster, he was fairly certain it was a world record at how fast he had down it. I love that show. Excitedly squealed Toga, Izuku merely stared at her with wide eyes, finally realizing how much help Toga truly needed, the monster under the bed so to speak, loving Boku no Pico. Hirajiri, prepare me the strongest coffee you can acquire, I'll be busy setting up a places that stain tends to hit, studying biology, and preparing a very detailed PowerPoint. Tiredly moaned Izuku, he had been awake since three in the morning, and Izuku knew it wouldn't be until tomorrow till he would be sleeping. Not all heroes were made, some are born, some were chosen, and Izuku was the latter with a mix of the other two, but the chaotic luck that clung to Izuku definitely lead him down to be the path of a hero. Maybe in some alternative universe he someone got a quirk, but Izuku realized something recently enough, this was his life, his destiny, the world was his oyster. I wouldn't trade this for anything. Idly realized Izuku, smiling slightly as Kirajiri took a shot of tequila before putting the kettle on, as Sensei and he reappeared in the room, blushing as Toga snuggled into him. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Rookie Deku becomes a hero. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Spudlord for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.